Introduction of Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Avai in February 2020. Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches, November 1914 to August 1923, by Benito Mussolini. Translated by Bernardo Caranta di San Severino. Introduction A Note on Italian Fascismo In an interesting article published last year in our press, Ettore Cicotti shows that Italian Fascismo does not represent an absolutely new political event, but is part of the general historic development of nations. In the first years of its appearance, it was compared to the Cryptea of Sparta, to the Eterie of Athens, and to similar phenomena, which are repeated as a manifestation of self-defense of strong and active groups or classes, uniting and forming centers of resistance, exercising thus, by their extended action, general functions of state in a period in which its protection is weak or inefficient and shows signs of disintegration or degeneration. Other examples of this phenomenon can be found in the history of the church and in the Italian communes, in England, Germany, in the clubs of the French Revolution and in the rest of Europe. When in a nation which shows such signs this form of vitality does not exist, we witness the general collapse of that nation, as in Russia at this moment, where only the radical uprooting of Bolshevism might lead to the general resurrection of the country. The after-war period in Italy, as elsewhere, has caused complete apathy, slackness and disorder in parliamentary state functions, characterized by many elaborate programs but few facts. The Italian working classes, moreover, had been hypnotized by the nefarious gospel of Lenin, which had powerfully contributed to bring about the grave state of affairs in Italy in 1920, when the communist peril had reached its acute stage. The continued strikes in all industries had caused prices to rise at a tremendous pace, the production of commodities had been reduced to a minimum, the enormous deficit in the railway and postal departments, the debt and the general budget of the state were alarming, while foreign exchanges had reached fantastic figures. The arrogance of the communist elements had become unbearable, and officers at times were obliged to dress in plain clothes in order not to be attacked by Bolshevists, while soldiers, carabiniers and guardie regie were frequently insulted and in some cases even killed by communists. But the gallant fighters of the Trentino, of the Carso and of the Grappa, the volunteers who had saved Italy and arrested the advance of the enemy on the Piave, could not reconcile themselves to this state of affairs, to the idea of watching with folded arms the complete loss of the fruits of victory for which half a million men had left their lives on the battlefields. These brave youths, with an indomitable courage, ready to face all, full of the purest ideals and passionate love for our country, representing a new force and a new Italy, had already in April 1919 grouped themselves together in a fascio, bundle, as the fascio nazionale dei combattenti, national faces of combatants, under the leadership of Benito Mussolini, who was the inspirer and organizer of the movement and had himself been their comrade at the front. They became stronger every day and dealt the initial blow to communism in 1921, when the first encounter took place between fascisti and communists at Bologna, which marks the waning of Bolshevism and the rise of fascismo. But it was not an easy matter for the new movement to make its way, as in its laborious progress it met with endless difficulties, and above all had to fight the apathy of the people and the general skepticism regarding it. Fascismo had to deal with peculiar mentalities, 
to fight various organizations, including the state, which felt itself being undermined by this new political group, while its chief enemy, the Bolshevist faction, had made endless victims among its rank and file during the past. It was not possible, however, for the fascisti to deal with the communists otherwise than by using violence, as normal means would have been entirely inadequate against the seditious elements, made all the more arrogant by the manifest impotence of the state and the laissez-faire attitude of public opinion, in view of the daily increasing numbers of crimes committed against property and peaceful individuals. Fascisti, moreover, started a strong movement against the composition of the chamber, maintaining that it no longer represented the nation, that it had grown prematurely old and must, therefore, be quickly dissolved and a new appeal to the electors be made as soon as possible. They had been deeply concerned, on the other hand, with the Italian economic crisis, which, according to Edmondo Rossoni, the able organizer and secretary-general of the syndicalist corporations, could not be overcome without an increase in the production of commodities to be obtained by a more rigorous discipline in the labor question. Thus, an economic victory followed the victory on the battlefields. The masses of the working classes, many of them previously socialists and communists, enrolled themselves among the fascisti syndicates scattered all over Italy and were able to settle various important disputes. The alleged dissension between fascismo and the Italian monarchy had always been a favorite weapon in the hands of the anti-fascisti elements. The Honorable Mussolini, in his speech at the great fascista mass meeting at Naples on 24th October of last year, clearly manifested his party feeling in the matter, as can be gathered by his own words uttered there. See Part 4, page 171 of this collection. The attitude of fascismo towards monarchy clearly defined by its leader was very opportune and contributed to the greater popularity to the movement throughout the country, where this institution rests on a solid base, represents Italian unity, and is today associated with its illustrious representative, King Victor Emmanuel III, an example of domestic virtue in private life, one of the most cultured men of our times, beloved by all classes, who at the front proved himself the first soldier among soldiers and gained the popularity of the whole nation. The army was secretly or openly greatly in favor of fascismo, the successful efforts of which to save the country from the social communist factions it could not forget. The soldiers could, therefore, never have marched against the fascisti, who represented Italian patriotism. The very generals of the regular army, such as Generals Fara, Ceccherini, Graziano, De Bono, and others, in black shirts, themselves directed the famous March to Rome. With reference to religion, Mussolini's government promised to respect all creeds, especially Catholicism. At Uschi, he said to the press, My spirit is deeply religious. Religion is a formidable force which must be respected and defended. I am, therefore, against anti-clerical and atheistic democracy, which represents an old and useless toy. I maintain that Catholicism is a great spiritual power, and I trust that the relations between church and state will henceforward be more friendly. And while the Minister for Public Instruction, Senator Gentile, has introduced compulsory religious instruction in the elementary public schools, the undersecretary of the same ministry, the Honorable Dario Lupi, one of Mussolini's closest friends, issued, as one of his first acts, a timely and preemptory order of the school authorities requesting the immediate replacement of the crucifix and the picture of the king. Fascismo, which during the last months of 1922 had seen its membership increasing by leaps and bounds, finally won with a note of fanaticism the very heart of the country, from the Alps to the southern shores of Sicily. 
Latterly it had exercised the functions of state almost undisturbed, and did not spare either institutions or individuals in the pursuit of its end. It had demanded, and successfully obtained, the dismissal of the pan-Germanist mayor of Bolzano, Herr Peratona. It had occupied the Junta Provinciale of Trento, causing the removal of the Italian governor, maintaining that he had been too weak in his attitude towards arrogant pan-Germanists in that region, and had acted successfully as arbitrator in the labor dispute between Cantiere Orlando of Leghorn and the government itself. It was no wonder, then, if after the big October meeting of last year at Naples, and the march to Rome with the famous quadrum virate formed by General Cesare de Bono, the Honorable Cesare Maria de Vecchi, Italo Balbo, and Michele Bianchi, then Secretary General of the party, Mussolini, the creator of this mighty movement, was summoned by the king to form the new fascista cabinet. It might be a cause of surprise to the superficial observer, this sudden ascent to power of a party which, a few days before it took the government into its hands, had been threatened with martial law, an order which the king wisely refused to sign, thus avoiding civil war. But whoever has followed the development and progress of fascismo during the last four years considers its great strength and power in the country, its formidable membership, now over a million strong, compared with that of any other party, the socialists are reduced to 70,000, and takes into account the high and patriotic principles on which this movement is founded, will not wonder that the party got to power through an extra-parliamentary crisis. We cannot and must not forget that these black shirts, as the fascisti are called, have really saved Italy from Bolshevism, which was sucking her very lifeblood, and that they are thereby entitled to the gratitude of our country and of the world at large. The Moscow conspirators, whose object was the overthrow of Western civilization, swept with a wide net, writes Lord Rothermere in his recent article, Mussolini, What Europe Owes to Him. They made great headway in Germany, especially in Berlin. They seized Budapest under the direction of a convicted thief, but it was upon Italy they counted most, and when Mussolini struck against them in Italy, he was fighting a battle for all Europe. I do not think, and the Honorable Mussolini agreed with me in one of the conversations I had with him, that people abroad, especially in England and the United States, know much about fascismo. It had been diagnosed as a sporadic revolutionary movement, which sooner or later would be put down by drastic measures. Not many have realized that in this after-war period there is no more important historical phenomenon than fascismo, which, as our Prime Minister said, is at the same time political, military, religious, economic and syndicalist, and represents all the hopes, the aspirations and requirements of the people. The popular air Giovinezza, Youth, the official song of the fascisti, with its thrilling notes which magnetized the heart of the people, the characteristic black shirts with the shield of the fascio on their breasts, the Gagliardetti, fascisti standards, all these have largely contributed towards rousing a delirium of enthusiasm among the masses for the great cause. But three other important elements account for the success of the National Fascista Party, as it is now officially constituted with its great national council, namely its military organization, its powerful press, and, above all, the personality of Mussolini himself the Duce, as he is called. The military organization is entirely on Roman lines, with Roman names of legion, consul, cohort, senior, centurion, decurion, triari, etc. The symbol of fascismo is the same as that of the lictors of imperial Rome, a bundle of rods with an axe in the center, and the fascista salute is that of the ancient Romans, by outstretched arms. 
the coins which are being struck bear on one side the king's head and on the other the roman fascio in the same way special gold coins of one hundred lire will be issued shortly to celebrate the first anniversary of the march to rome there is the most rigorous discipline and the motto no discussion only obedience has proved of immense value in all of the sudden mobilizations and demobilizations carried out often at a few hours notice which could give points to the best organized army in the world on the occasion of the mass meeting preceding the march to rome which was attended by over half a million men in less than twenty-four hours forty thousand left the town in perfect order and without the slightest hitch fascismo possesses a large press which comprises five dailies and a large number of weekly fortnightly and monthly publications and a publishing house in milan but the decisive factor in the great victory of fascismo is due to the personality of the great leader of this army of italy's salvation the very soul of this mighty movement few public men of our time have had a more rapid brilliant and interesting career than benito mussolini the son of a blacksmith he is the youngest of his predecessors in this office as he was born only forty years ago at predapio in the province of forli where the villagers still call him simply our bennett he was deeply attached to his mother rosa maltoni and her death caused him intense sorrow he has one sister edwige and a younger brother arnaldo who since the elder one has become prime minister has taken his place as editor of il popolo d'italia mussolini first worked in his father's forge and then having occupied for a time the position of village schoolmaster emigrated to switzerland from which country he was however expelled on account of articles he had written advocating the marxist doctrines returning once more to italy he became an active member of the socialist party and finally editor of its organ the avanti upon the outbreak of war in nineteen fourteen with his keen political insight mussolini saw the necessity of italian intervention and in consequence was forced to leave the official socialist party giving up all the positions he held in it he founded his popolo d'italia and began fiercely to sound the trumpets of war inciting his country to abandon her neutral attitude and to throw in her lot with the allies he gained his end and in nineteen fifteen he went to the front as a simple soldier in the eleventh bersagliere regiment in nineteen seventeen as the result of the bursting of a shell he received thirty-eight simultaneous wounds he was obliged to go to hospital was promoted on the field and invalided out of the army he then returned to milan and having resumed the editorship of his paper the popolo d'italia began his political battles and continued to fight through its columns spurring his countrymen on to final victory with no exaggeration it can be stated that since the advent to power of mussolini every day has seen a steady advance in the direction of the rebuilding of the country within and a notable enhancement of our prestige abroad his strenuous everyday work is inspired by an indomitable determination to make italy worthy of the glories of vittorio veneto strengthened and disciplined and he will spare neither himself nor those around him in his attempt to bring about its realization he wishes to secure italy's rightful position in the world mussolini's foreign policy of dignity honesty and justice has already been outlined in his opening speech before the chamber and can be summarized thus no imperialism no aggressions but an attitude which shall do away with the policy of humility which has made italy more like the cinderella and humble servant of other nations respect for international treaties at no matter what cost fidelity and friendship towards the nations that give italy serious proofs of reciprocating it maintenance of eastern equilibrium on which depends the tranquillity of the balkan states 
and therefore European and world peace. It is enough to cast an eye on the numerous legislative and administrative work accomplished by Mussolini's government in these first eleven months to convince oneself that he is in deep earnest as to the vast program of reconstruction he means to carry through. With reference to domestic matters, the fascista government has passed a great number of bills and projects of laws concerning the electoral reform bill approved by the chamber last July, radical reform of the entire school system, institution of the national militia, and abolition of the guardie regie, which was a poor substitute for the carabiniers, industrialization of public services, posts, telegraphs, railways, abolition of death duties between near relations, enactment of decree on the eight hours work bill, reformation of the civil law codes, reduction of ministerial departments, now only nine which formerly were sixteen, and formation of the recent Ministry of National Economy, under which are grouped various others, industry, agriculture, labor, etc., reduction of the national debt by over a milliard, a comforting contribution towards the balance of the budget, as is gathered by the speech delivered in June at Milan by the Mystery of Finance, the Honorable De Stefani. Mussolini, besides having established a real discipline, there are no more strikes since the fascista government is in power, and having fully restored the authority of the state, has shown himself to be the most practical anti-waste advocate which the world has yet known. As to foreign policy, besides adhering to the Washington Disarmament Conference and having signed conventions relative to the laying of cables for a direct telegraphic communication with North, Central and South America, negotiated important commercial treaties with Canada, Russia, Spain, Lithuania, Poland, Siam, Finland, Estonia, etc., and having exercised beneficial influence in the Ruhr conflict and in the Lausanne conference, has been an element of equilibrium for the new after-war international policy in the world. The selection of his speeches contained in this volume is not a mere translation, since, in fact, the exact equivalent of this book as it has been arranged, classified and edited is not to be found in any other language. These speeches, illustrated by the valuable prefatory notes, almost all of which have been supplied to me by one who has been closely associated with Mussolini during the whole of his political career, serve, in my opinion, as could no biography, to reveal the mind, character, and personality of Mussolini himself. Delivered at intervals throughout the various stages of his career, from socialist to fascista prime minister, they enable the reader to follow intimately the events which led up to the fascista revolution and its leader's attainment of his present strong position. The forcible and sober style of his character, shorn of every unnecessary word, betrays the dynamic force and intense earnestness of this man, who has been compared to Cromwell for his drastic and dictatorial methods in the chamber, and to Napoleon for his eagle-like perception, for his decisiveness, and his marvellous power of leadership. Mussolini is a volcanic genius, a bewitcher of crowds. He seems a regular warrior, with an indomitable daring, great physical and moral courage, and he has seen death near him without wavering. He is the real type of Roman emperor, with a severe bronzed face, but which hides a kind and generous heart. He is what people call a real self-made man, and is a great lover of the violin and of all kinds of sport, fencing, cycling, flying, riding, and motoring. Mussolini gets all he wants, and quickly, and, as all his party do, knows exactly what he does want. Apart from all that has been said, the present collection of speeches, besides showing Mussolini's strong hand in the difficult art of statesmanship, displays clearly in almost every page, 
and so, possibly, the book may also appeal to others than politicians, additional important elements which are not usually found in a volume of political speeches, namely a richness of sympathy for mankind, a blunt straightforwardness, a gentleness of soul together with exceptional moral strength, pure idealism which lift him not only above party politics, but also high above the average of mankind. Such is the builder of New Italy, and the enthusiasm and deep confidence which Mussolini has inspired in our country, and the unanimous approval his work has prompted abroad, are a good omen for Italy's future fortunes and for the welfare of the world at large. Bernardo Caranta di San Severino Siena, Via San Chirico, No. 1, October 1923 Reproduction of the original of the manifesto issued by the Honorable Mussolini after he and his party succeeded to the government. English translation. Fascista National Party. Fascisti of all Italy. Our movement has been crowned with success. The leader of our party now holds the political power of the state for Italy and abroad. While this new government represents our triumph, it celebrates, at the same time, our victory in the name of those who by land and by sea promoted it, and it accepts also, for the purpose of pacification, men from other parties, provided they are true to the cause of the nation. The Italian fascisti are too intelligent to wish to abuse their victory. Fascisti the supreme quadrumvirate, which has resigned its powers in favor of the party, thanks you for the magnificent proof of courage and of discipline which you have given, and salutes you. You have proved yourselves worthy of the fortunes and of the future of your fatherland. Demobilize in the same perfectly orderly manner in which you assembled for this great achievement, destined, as we firmly believe, to open a new era in the history of Italy. Return now to your usual occupations, as, in order to arrive at the summit of her fortunes, Italy needs to work. May nothing disturb the glory of these days through which we have just passed, days of superb passion and of Roman greatness. Long live Italy. Long live fascismo. The Quadrum Virate. End of Introduction Section 1 of Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches Part 1. Mussolini the Socialist, 25th November, 1914 Do not think that by taking away my membership card, you will take away my faith in the cause. Speech delivered on 25th November 1914 at Milan before the meeting of the Milanese Socialist Section, which had decreed Mussolini's expulsion from the official Socialist Party. In the fearless militarism of the dramatic speech with which this volume begins, the socialistic activity of Benito Mussolini ends of benito mussolini who from the autumn of nineteen fourteen could have been considered the recognized and acclaimed leader of the italian socialist party he had attained with giant strides the highest rank in the party's hierarchy namely the editorship of the avante the chief organ of the political and syndicalist movement he had been a clever and aggressive writer in a weekly provincial paper of forley called la lata de classe and an ardent sunday orator for the via of romagna he had revealed himself a comrade of tremendous power at the congress of regio emilia held in the summer of nineteen twelve where he delivered a memorable speech bitterly criticizing the flaccid mentality of reformism then dominating the party it was within two months of his success at Reggio Emilia that the revolutionary leaders, feeling the need of strong men, entrusted to Benito Mussolini the editorship of the Avanti, which was the most powerful weapon of the party. 
the following speech was delivered before a furious crowd of not less than three thousand holders of membership cards who hastened from other centres adjacent to milan amid a diabolical tumult in an atmosphere of organised hostility which was the more violent by contrast with the fanatical devotion which benito mussolini had evoked during the two years in which he had been the undisputed mouthpiece of the party this atmosphere of intolerance and hatred had been fostered by the neutralist adversaries who had succeeded in the management of the avanti after the present head of the italian government had left the party as is known the excited meeting held in the spacious hall of the casa del popolo closed with a resolution for the expulsion of the new heretic which was passed except by a negligible minority of about fifty supporters who afterwards stood by mussolini in the victorious campaign for intervention my fate is decided and it seems as if the sentence were to be executed with a certain solemnity voices louder louder you are severer than ordinary judges who allow the fullest and most exhaustive defence even after the sentence since they give ten days for the production of the motives of appeal if then it is decided and you still think that i am unworthy of fighting any longer for your cause yes yes is shouted by some of the most excited among the audience then expel me but i have a right to exact a legal act of accusation and in this meeting the public prosecutor has not yet intervened with regard either to the political or to the moral issues i shall therefore be condemned by an order of the day which means nothing in a case like this i ought to have been told that i was unworthy to belong any longer to the party for definite reasons in which case i should have accepted my fate this however has not been said and a great many of you if not all will leave this room with an uneasy conscience deafening voices no no with reference to the moral question i repeat once more that i am ready to submit my case to any committee which cares to make investigations and to issue a report as regards the question of discipline i should say that this has not been examined because there are just and fitting precedents for my changed attitude and if i do not quote them it is because i feel myself to be secure and have an easy conscience you think to sign my death warrant but you are mistaken today you hate me because in your heart of hearts you still love me because applause and hisses interrupt the speaker but you have not seen the last of me twelve years of my party life are or ought to be a sufficient guarantee of my faith in socialism socialism is something which takes root in the heart what divides me from you now is not a small dispute but a great question over which the whole of socialism is divided amokari cipriani can no longer be your candidate because he declared both by word of mouth and in writing that if his seventy-five years allowed him he would be in the trenches fighting the european military reaction which was stifling revolution time will prove who is right and who is wrong in the formidable question which now confronts socialism and which it has never had to face before in the history of humanity since never before has there been such a conflagration as exists today in which millions of the proletariat are pitted one against the other this war which has much in common with those of the napoleonic period is not an everyday event waterloo was fought in eighteen fourteen perhaps nineteen fourteen will see some other principles fall to the ground will see the salvation of liberty and the beginning of a new era in the world's history loud applause greets this fitting historical comparison 
and especially in the history of the proletariat which at all critical moments has found me here with you in this same spot just as it found me in the street but i tell you that from now onwards i shall never forgive nor have pity on any one who in this momentous hour does not speak his mind for fear of being hissed or shouted down this cutting allusion to the many prominent absentees is understood and warmly applauded by the meeting i shall neither forgive nor have pity on those who are purposely reticent those who show themselves hypocrites and cowards and you will find me still on your side you must not think that the middle classes are enthusiastic about our intervention they snarl and accuse us of temerity and fear that the proletariat once armed with bayonets will use them for their own ends mingled applause and cries of no no do not think that in taking away my membership card you will be taking away my faith in the cause or that you will prevent my still working for socialism and revolution hearty applause follows these last words of mussolini uttered with great energy and profound conviction he descends from the platform and makes his way down the great hall end of section one section two of mussolini as revealed in his political speeches section two part two mussolini the man of the war thirteenth december nineteen fourteen for the liberty and humanity and the future of italy speech delivered at the squala maza parma thirteenth december nineteen fourteen this speech was delivered under the stress of great excitement the most ardent supporters of active neutrality were assembled at the parma a citadel of revolutionary syndicalism which opposed party socialism and the majority of whose members after the outbreak of the european war sided with the central empires and in defense of intervention among these we remember giacinto menotti serati then editor-in-chief of the avanti and fulvio zocchi a ridiculous and malignant demagogue now removed from political power but notwithstanding this pressure from outside the people of parma mindful of their garibaldian and anti-austrian traditions sided enthusiastically with mussolini and alcesto de ombres the leader of syndicalism and member of parliament for the city who had been the first to support the section of the extremists citizens it is in your interest to listen to me quietly and with tolerance i shall be brief precise and sincere to the point of rudeness the last great continental war was from eighteen seventy to eighteen seventy one prussia guided by bismarck and moltke defeated france and robbed her of two flourishing and populous provinces the treaty of frankfurt marked the triumph of bismarck's policy which aimed at the incontestable hegemony of prussia in central europe and the gradual slavization of the balkan zones of austria-hungary one recalls these features of bismarck's policy in trying to understand the different international crises which took place in europe from seventy up to the bewildering and extremely painful situation of today from seventy onwards there were only remoter wars among the peoples of eastern europe such as those between russia and turkey serbia and bulgaria greece and turkey or wars in the colonies there was in consequence a widespread conviction that a european or world war was no longer possible 
the most diverse reasons were put forward to maintain this argument illusions and sophisms it was suggested for example that the perfecting of the instruments for making war must destroy its possibility ridiculous war has always been deadly the perfecting of arms is relative to the progress technical mechanical and military of the human race in this respect the warlike machines of the ancient romans are the equivalent of the mortars of four hundred and twenty caliber they are made with the object of killing and they do kill the perfecting of instruments of war is no hindrance to warlike instincts it might have the opposite effect reliance was also placed on human kindness and other sentiments of humanity of brotherhood and love which ought it was maintained to bind all the different branches of the species man together regardless of barriers of land or sea another illusion it is true that these feelings of sympathy and brotherliness exist our century has in truth seen the rapid multiplication of philanthropic works for the alleviation of the hardships both of men and of animals but along with these impulses exist others profounder higher and more vital we should not explain the universal phenomenon of war by attributing it to the caprices of monarchs race hatred or economic rivalry we must take into account other feelings which each of us carries in his heart and which made proud hone exclaim with that perennial truth which hides beneath the mask of paradox that war was of divine origin it was also maintained that the encouragement of closer international relations economic artistic intellectual political and sporting by causing the peoples to become better acquainted would have prevented the outbreak of war among civilized nations norman argel had founded his book upon the impossibility of war proving that all nations involved victors and vanquished alike would have their economic life completely convulsed and ruined in consequence another illusion laid bare lack of observation the purely economic man does not exist the story of the world is not merely a page of bookkeeping the material interests luckily are not the only mainspring of human actions it is true that international relations have multiplied that there is or was freer interchange political and economic between the peoples of the different countries than there was a century ago but parallel with this phenomenon is another which is that the people with a diffusion of culture and the formation of an economic system of a national type tend to isolate themselves psychologically and morally internationalism side by side with the peaceful middle-class movement which is not worth examination flourished another of an international character that of the working classes at the outbreak of war this class too gave evidence of its inefficiency the germans who ought to have set the example flocked as a man to the kaiser's banner the treachery of the germans forced the socialists of other countries to fall back upon the basis of nationality and the necessity of national defense the german unity automatically determined the unity of the other countries it is said and justly that international relations are like love it takes two to carry them on internationalism is ended that which existed yesterday is dead and it is impossible to foresee what form it will take tomorrow reality cannot be done away with and cannot be ignored and the reality is that millions and millions of men for the most part of the working classes are standing opposite one another today on the blood-drenched battlefields of europe the neutrals who shout themselves hoarse crying down with war do not realize the grotesque cowardice contained in that cry today 
it is irony of the most atrocious kind to shout down with war while men are fighting and dying in the trenches the real situation between the two groups the triple entente and the austrian german alliance italy has remained neutral in the triple entente there is heroic serbia who has broken loose from the austrian yoke there is martyred belgium who refused to sell herself there is republican france who has been attacked there is democratic england there is autocratic russia though her foundations are undermined by revolution on the other side there is austria clerical and feudal and germany militarist and aggressive at the outbreak of war italy proclaimed herself neutral was the exception contemplated in the treaties it seems as if it were so especially in view of the recent revelations made by giolitti if the neutrality of the government meant indifference the neutrality of the socialists and the economic organizations had an entirely different character and significance the socialistic neutrality intended a general strike in the case of alliance with austria no practical opposition in the case of a war against her a distinction was made therefore between one war and another further the classes were allowed to be called up if the government had mobilized all the socialists would have found it a natural and logical proceeding they admitted therefore that a nation has the right and duty to defend itself by recourse to arms in case of attack from outside neutrality understood in this way had necessarily to lead with the progress of events especially in belgium to the idea of intervention the bourgeoisie is neutral it is controversial whether italy has a bourgeoisie in the generally accepted sense of the word rather than the bourgeoisie and lower classes there are rich and poor in any case it is untrue that the italian middle class are at the moment jingoist on the contrary they are neutral and desperately pacifist the banking world is neutral the industrial classes have reorganized their business and the agrarian population small and great are pacifists by tradition and temperament the political and academic middle classes are neutral look at the senate there are perhaps exceptions young men who do not wish to stagnate in the dead pool of neutrality but the middle classes taken as a whole are hostile to war and neutral as a conclusive proof compare the tone of the middle class papers today with that shown at the time of the libyan campaign and note the difference the trumpet call which then sounded for war is muffled now the language of the middle class press is uncertain wavering and mysterious neutral in word but in effect in favor of the allies where are the trumpets that summoned us in the september of nineteen eleven the secret is out and ought to make the socialists who are not stupid stop and think on the one side are all the conservative and stagnant elements and on the other the revolutionary and the living forces of the country it is necessary to choose we want the war but we want the war and we want it at once it is not true that military preparation is lacking what does this waiting for the spring to come mean socialism ought not and cannot be against all wars because in that case it would have to deny fifty years of history do you want to judge and condemn in the same breath the war of tripoli and the result of the french revolution of seventeen ninety three and garibaldi is he too a jingoist you must distinguish between one war and another as between one crime and another one case of bloodshed and another bovio said all the water in the sea will not suffice to remove the stain from the hands of lady macbeth but a basinful 
would wash the blood from the hands of Garibaldi. Gizda, in a congress of French socialists held a few weeks before the outbreak of war, declared that, in case of a conflagration, the nation that was the most socialist would be the victim of the nation that was least. To prove this, notice the behavior of the Italian socialists. Look at them in Parliament. Traves lost time by quibbling. At one moment he exclaimed, quote, We shall not deny the country. End quote. In fact, the country cannot be denied. One does not deny one's mother even if she does not offer one all her gifts, even if she does force one to earn one's living in the alluring streets of the world. Great applause. Trave said more. We shall not oppose a war of defense. If this is admitted, the necessity of arming ourselves is admitted. You will not open the gates of Italy yet to the Austrian army, because they will come to pillage the houses and violate the women. I know it well. There are base wretches who blame Belgium for defending herself. She might have pocketed the money of the Germans, they say, and allowed them a free passage, while resistance meant laying herself open to the scientific and systematic destruction of her towns. But Belgium lives, and will live, because she refused to sell herself ignobly. If she had done so, she would be dead for all time. Great applause and cries of, Long live Belgium! The cheering lasts for some minutes. The War of Defense When do you want to begin to defend yourselves? When the enemy's knee is on your chest? Wouldn't it be better to begin a little earlier? Wouldn't it be better to begin today, when it would not cost so much, rather than wait until tomorrow, when it might be disastrous? Do you wish to maintain a splendid isolation? But in that case we must arm, arm and create a colossal militarism. The socialists, and I am still one, although an exasperated one, never brought forward the question of irredentism but left it to the Republicans. We are in favor of a national war. But there are also reasons, purely socialist in character, which spur us on towards intervention. The Europe of Tomorrow It is said that the Europe of tomorrow will not be any different from the Europe of yesterday. This is the most absurd and alarming hypothesis. If you accept it, there is some absolute meaning for your neutrality. It is not worth while sacrificing oneself in order to leave things as they were before. But both mind and heart refuse to believe that this spilling of blood over three continents will lead to nothing. Everything leads one to believe, on the contrary, that the Europe of tomorrow will be profoundly transformed. Greater liberty or greater reaction? more or less militarism which of the two groups of powers by their victory would assure us of better conditions of liberty for the working classes there is no doubt about the answer and in what way do you wish to assist in the triumph of the triple entente perhaps with articles in the paper and orders of the day in committee are these sentimental manifestations enough to raise up belgium again to relieve France, the France which bled for Europe in the revolutions and wars of 89 to 71 and from 71 to 14? Do you then offer to the France of the rights of man nothing but words? Against Apathy Tell me, and this is the supreme reason for intervention, tell me, is it human, civilized, socialistic, to stop quietly at the window while blood is flowing in the torrents, and to say, I am not going to move, it does not matter to me a bit? Can the formula of sacred egoism devised by the Honorable Salandra be accepted by the working classes? No, I do not think so. 
the law of solidarity does not stop at economic competition it goes beyond yesterday it was both fine and necessary to contribute in aid of struggling companions but today they ask you to shed your blood for them they implore it intervention will shorten the period of terrible carnage that will be to the advantage of all even of the germans our enemies will you refuse this proof of solidarity if you do with what dignity will you italian proletarians show yourselves abroad tomorrow do you not fear that your german comrades will reject you because you betrayed the triple entente do you not fear that those in france and belgium showing you their land still scarred by graves and trenches and pointing out with pride their ruined towns will say to you where were you and what did you do o italian proletarians when we fought desperately against the austro-german militarism to free europe from the incubus of the hegemony of the kaiser in that day you will not know how to answer in that day you will be ashamed to be italian but it will be too late the people's war let us take up again the italian traditions the people who want the war want it without delay in two months time it might be an act of brigandage today it is a war to be fought with courage and dignity war and socialism are incompatible understood in their universal sense but every epoch and every people has had its wars life is relative the absolute only exists in the cold and unfruitful abstract those who set too much store by their skins will not go into the trenches and you will not find them even in the streets in the day of battle he who refuses to fight today is an accomplice of the kaiser and a prop of the tottering throne of francis joseph do you wish mechanical germany intoxicated by bismarck to be once more the free and unprejudiced germany of the first half of last century do you wish for a german republic extending from the rhine to the vistula does the idea of the kaiser a prisoner and banished to some remote island make you laugh germany will only find her soul through defeat with the defeat of germany the new and brilliant spring will burst over europe it is necessary to act to move to fight and if necessary to die neutrals have never dominated events they have always gone under it is blood which moves the wheels of history frantic bursts of applause end of section two section three of mussolini as revealed in his political speeches 25th january 1915 either war or the end of Italy's name as a great power. Speech delivered at Milan, 25th January 1915. The progress of Milanese, which is to say of Italian interventionalism, thanks to the authority and the influence of the Lombard metropolis, the throbbing heart of the country, begins with the meeting held in the Great Hall of the Istituto Tecnico Carlo Gattaneo. At this meeting there were present 45 fasci, called Fasci di Azione Revolutionaria, formed almost entirely in the principal regional and provincial centers. Among the most notable supporters were a group of soldiers of the 61st and 62nd Infantry, the poet Ceccardo Roccataliata Ceccardi, and the old Garibaldian patriot Ergisto Bezzi called the Ferruccio of the Trentino. 
I thank you for your greeting and am happy and proud to be present at this meeting which represents, perhaps, in these six months of a neutrality of commercialism and smuggling, branded with socialism, a new fact of the utmost importance and significance. While listening to the reports which were made here, my mind carried me back to the first congresses of the international when the representatives of the various sections of the different countries prepared written reports which gave full details as to the situations of the respective peoples. This was a splendid means of coming to a closer understanding. I pass now to speak of the international state of affairs. The diplomatic and political situation cannot be spoken of without the military, The military situation is stationary, although today it is clearly in favor of the Germans who occupy the whole of Belgium, with the exception of 880 square kilometers, who hold 10 rich and populous departments of France and a great part of Russian Poland. Besides the recent attack upon Dunkirk and the activity of the submarines and dirigibles showed that the Germans are still full of fight and wish to carry the war on literally to the utmost limits of their powers of attack and defense. Thus the intervention of Italy is not late. I think the right moment has come now when the military situation hangs in the balance. There is neither advance nor retreat on either side, for which reason it would be a good thing to decide the game by the introduction of a new factor, the intervention of Italy and Romania. The principal international events of this week have been the Berthold resignations, the considerations of intervention by Romania, and the Treaty of the Triple Entente for the regulation of Russia's financial difficulties. Russia. It really seems to me that there was a moment of slackness in the pursuit of the war on the part of Austria and Russia. It is enough to call to mind a short paragraph in an official Russian paper, the Raskoye Slovo, in order to realize that there was a time when Russia wavered. It is true, says the paper, that on the 4th September, Russia, France, England, Belgium and Serbia undertook not to make peace individually, but this pledge brings with it the necessity of supporting the expenses of war in common, especially now that Turkey has come to the help of the central powers. Our treasury is empty. Where can we obtain that money which is more important than man? If England refuses, we shall be obliged to end the war in any way convenient to Russia. Really threatening words these, of which England, however, understood the meaning and immediately took steps to prevent their realization by launching the loan of 50 milliards in favor of Russia to be subscribed to in the capitals of the Triple Entente. And, in fact, immediately after the announcement of the loan, the tone of the official papers changed and there was no more talk of making a separate peace. Austria There were other symptoms of restlessness in Austria. Clearly, up to the present, Austria has been sacrificed the most. She has lost Galicia and been defeated by the Russians and Serbs. It may be that the resignation of Berthold is an indication that Austrian politics are taking a new direction. In what sense? I do not think in the pacifist sense. Austria is tied to Germany and Germany leans upon Austria and Hungary. Berian's journey to the German general staff was made, I think, with the object of obtaining military aid for Hungary. Austria and Hungary are preparing themselves against Romania because this nation will probably intervene before Italy. Romania. Romania has four million men concentrated in Transylvania under the rule of Austria-Hungary. 
She is a young nation with a perfect army of 500,000 men and she will be obliged to end her hesitation, probably owing to the fact that the Russians are at her frontier. Nothing would embarrass the Romanians as much as this, since they remember that in 1878 the Russians occupied Bessarabia. When the Russians therefore are in Transylvania, the intervention of Romania will be decided at once. Vallona One fact that has certain importance where Italy is concerned is the occupation of Vallona, which has come about in curious circumstances with the occupation of Sasseno and the landing of the Marines before the Bersaglieri. I do not think that there are really rebels in Albania, and I think that Italy will stop at Valona. I do not think either that Valona will run any serious risk because the Albanians have rifles but no artillery. Albania does not exist in the true sense of the word, as the Albanians are divided both by race and tribe. And I do not think that an organized movement is to be feared. Switzerland One point that we must take into consideration is the position of Switzerland, a point to my mind rather obscure. It is true that we can feel to a certain extent reassured by the fact that the president of Switzerland at the moment is an Italian. But without doubt, a restless state of mind prevails among the German element there. The voice of race calls louder than the voice of political union. The German Swiss lay down laws. They circulate pamphlets which say, let us remain Swiss. They go in search of the Swiss spirit, but I think that it would be difficult to find it. In any case, it is certain that they make acid comments on the articles in the Popolo d'Italia. Taking as a whole, it can be said that the pan-German movement has developed in German Switzerland, which manifests open sympathy towards the central powers. Zahn, a Swiss writer, in this way published an ode and sent money to the German Red Cross. A political personality of Basel sent information about the troops and the Swiss defense to the Frankfurter Zeitung. The novelist Schapfer of Basel went to Berlin to extol Germany and to sing Deutschland über alles at a public meeting. The journalist Schapner advocated in the Neues Deutschland, that Switzerland should abandon her neutral position in order to help Germany and have as compensation Upper Savoy, the Czech region, and a part of Franche Comte, so that she might form an advanced post of Germany towards the south, declaring at the same time an alliance with Austria-Hungary, which would enable Switzerland to extend her boundaries also towards Italy. The Neue Zürcher Nachrichten has even gone to the extent of taunting Belgium with her unhappy fate, saying that the neutrality of Belgium would have been violated by her own government and calling her the betrayer of Germany and saying that Germany had every right to punish her. These are all documents which are worthwhile knowing about because They denote a state of mind that might have a surprise in store for us. Switzerland is made up of 24 cantons, in one of which the Italian language is spoken. But I don't think that much reliance can be placed on that fact. For the rest, I know that the general staff preoccupies itself a good deal with the possibility that, either through love or fear, Switzerland will allow the Kaiser's troops to pass through Swiss territory, in which case they would then find themselves at once in Lombardy. The Dilemma of Italy This meeting, therefore, asks for the repudiation of the Treaty of the Triple Alliance as the first step to mobilization and war. 
Otherwise, if the treaty is still in force, you can see how it can be interpreted in any sense. At first it bound us to intervene on the side of Austria and Germany, and we were taxed with being traitors when we declared ourselves neutral. Today it proves that it is our duty to remain neutral. Treaties then are interpreted according to the letter, according to the spirit and according to the convenience of those who have to interpret them. Necessity demands therefore the explicit repudiation of the Treaty of the Triple Alliance. Perhaps this can be made the casus belli. We are not diplomats, but it is certain that if Italy repudiates the Treaty of the Triple Alliance, Germany will ask for explanations, and if, at the same time, there was a mobilization against Austria and Germany, we should be able to reach the stage in which a solution by arms would be forced upon us. For us, the casus belli was magnificent and solemn, It was that created by the violation of the neutrality of Belgium. Italy ought to intervene in the name of Jus Gentium, in the name of her own national security. She has not been able to do so then, but now we must decide. Either war or the end of our name as a great power. Let us build gambling houses and hotels and grow fat. A people can have this ideal also, which is shared by the lower zoological species. In reality, the German working classes have embraced the cause of Prussian militarism. And so, my friends, the chief reason for remaining neutral falls to the ground. You Italian socialists are preparing to commit the same crime of which you accuse the German socialists. We, in the meantime, question the right of the German socialists to call themselves socialists anymore. The international compact is only of value when it is signed and respected by all the contracting parties. Since the Germans are the first to have broken it, the Italians are no longer under obligation to hold by a contract which might mean the ruin. It is a fact, however, that Italy is still bound to the Triple Alliance. This government of ours is pusillanimous, because the repudiation of the Triple Alliance does not mean a declaration of war or even mobilization. But meanwhile... This would prove that the Italian people vindicate the right to independence of action in this period of history. The Revolutionary War To say that we are causing a revolution in order to obtain war is to say something which we cannot maintain. We have not the strength. We find ourselves face to face with formidable coalitions, but the fasci of action have this object to create that state of mind which will impose war upon the country. Tomorrow, if Italy does not make war, a revolutionary position will be inevitably decided and discontent will spring up everywhere. Those same men who today are in favor of neutrality, when they feel themselves humiliated as men and Italians, will ask the responsible powers to account for it. And then will be our chance. Then we shall have our war. Then we shall say to the dominant classes, you have not proved yourself capable of fulfilling your task. You have deceived us and destroyed our aspirations. Your first care should have been the completion of the unity of the country, and you have ignored it. You have been warned about it by democracy in general and by the Republican Party particularly. This will be a case which will surely end in condemnation, in condemnation which cannot be other than capital. And then, perhaps, we shall issue from this harassing period of history. Every day we feel that there is something in Italy which does not work, that there is a cog missing in the gear or a wheel 
that does not go round. The country is young, but its institutions are old. And when, if I may be allowed to quote once more from Karl Marx, the old pan-Germanist, a conflict between new forces and old institutions begins to shape itself, that means that the new wine cannot any longer be kept in the old skins, or the inevitable will occur. The old forces of the political and social life in Italy will fall into fragments. Loud applause. End of section 3. Section 4 of Mussolini as revealed in his political speeches. To the complete vanquishing of the Huns. Speech delivered at Sesto San Giovanni, 1st December, 1917. After the Caporetto disaster, the patriotic organizations of Milan had consolidated their union, previously undermined by the opponents of the war, who, thanks to the leniency of the government, had been able to work in the interest of the enemy. They developed the existing sphere of propaganda, advocating resistance within the country. One of the centers most infected by neutralist opposition was undoubtedly Sesto San Giovanni, a large borough of the working classes at the gates of Milan, completely controlled by social communist administration. Mussolini, having just left the military hospital, where he had been lying ill as a result of many wounds received when a bear Salieri of the 11th Regiment, spoke in this hostile citadel as only he could speak, and it is certainly beyond question that his frank and incisive eloquence was mainly instrumental in dispersing the bitter anti-war feelings, fomented by stubborn and impudent socialist neutralism. Workmen and citizens! The other evening, after three years' silence, I spoke to the audience of the Scala, an imposing audience and a large hall. But I prefer this friendly gathering of workmen and soldiers, because, in spite of everything, I am, and shall always remain, one of the masses which produce and work, and the implacable adversary of every parasite. The International Illusion I am here to talk to you of the war and to remind you of an article, which some of you will still remember, in which, in a certain degree, I foresaw this truce. A truce of arms, I called it then, and I repeat these words today. When one speaks of war, one must do so with a clear conscience, and without all those useless ornaments of speech, typical of an old, artificial style of literature. We must remember that while we stand together here to think of them, the best among our men, our brothers, your sons, and husbands are consuming themselves, suffering and perhaps dying for us, for our country, and for our civilization. We wished for the war, it is true, but because the arrogance of other men imposed it upon us. We have entertained the illusion that it was possible to realize the international dream among the peoples. But, while we were sincerely putting our faith in this beautiful chimera, the German internationals, with Bebel at their head, were declaring themselves to be first Germans and afterwards socialists. And in the international congresses, the Germans always systematically refused to bind themselves to decisive action with the socialists of other countries, under the specious pretext that the retrograde constitution of their country did not allow them to, without jeopardizing their organization, to conclude international agreements. They held too much by their organizations by their hundred and one deputies, and by the fat and swollen purse of Marx, which is the only thing which has been saved from German socialism. Loud applause. While Germany was preparing for war by organizing formidable means of dominion and massacre, nobody in England, France, Italy, or Russia dreamed of the imminence of the terrible scourge. The True Germany We had a very wrong idea of Germany. We only knew the Germany of the flaxen-haired Gretchens and of homesick novels, and not that of von Bernhardi, Hardin, and the Hohenzollerns. It was Germany who wanted the war. Hardin said so in an ill-considered outburst of sincerity. The socialists, who claimed more land for the expansion of the German people, wanted it. Spectacled professors, incapable of synthesis, but terrible in analysis, prepared it. The military caste imposed it. The pretext for the unchaining of these forces was soon found. Two revolver shots in 1914, some bombs thrown. Two imperial corpses hurried away in a court coach were the pretext. The war for which the central powers were prepared blazed up on all sides. The Socialist Intervention 
We socialists, who were in favor of intervention, advocated war because we divined that it contained within it the seeds of revolution. It is not the first instance of revolutionary war. There were the Napoleonic Wars, the War of 1870, the Enterprises of Garibaldi, in which, had we lived in those days, we should have joined in the same spirit and the same faith. Karl Marx, too, was a jingoist. In 1855, he wrote that Germany would have been obliged to declare war against Russia. And in 1870, he said of the French, They must be defeated. They will never be sufficiently beaten. And when in 1871, the socialists of France, with Latin ingeniousness, after declaring the Republic, said a passionate appeal to the Germans for peace, Karl Marx said, These imbeciles of Frenchmen claim that for their rag of a republic, we should renounce all the advantages of this war. One does not deny one's country. It is possible to remain a socialist and be in favor of certain wars. When the country is in danger, it is not possible to remain a pacifist. A man cannot ignore his country any more than a tree can ignore the earth which provides its sustenance. Applause. Our people have understood it, and you, who carry in your veins some drops of the warrior blood of those men of Legnano, who drove away Barbarossa, of the people of Gincorgianate, join with me today in inciting our soldiers to free our land from the shame of servitude. Applause. To deny one's country, especially in a critical hour of her existence, is to deny one's mother. It was thought that the soldier strike would bring peace. But when our soldiers found that the enemy, instead of throwing down their rifles, mounted cannons and field guns, instead of fraternizing, massacred old men, women, and children, and far from returning to their own country, advanced into ours, they only waited until a large enough river divided them from the adversary to place before them once again the impassable barrier of the Italian forces. Loud applause. Our setback is not due to fear of the Germans. The victors of eleven battles, the soldiers of Carso, Beasizza, Montesanto, Cucca, and of Sabatino, do not fear spiked helmets. The armies of all the combatant countries have had moments of bewilderment, but not one recovered itself as quickly as we have. After only one week of retreat, our troops faced the enemy again and forced them back. A resolute resistance. We have skirted the abyss. We might have been lost, but we have saved ourselves. While the Germans were hoping for still further revolution, the soldiers reestablished the force of resistance, which had been weakened. And now at the front, the only fraternity is that of rifle shots. Applause. When the storm is past, we shall be proud of having done our duty. Wilson, convinced pacifist, was drawn into the war by an elevated humanitarian motive, which made him feel that to prolong the war was an act of intolerable complicity with the Germans, and he gives us an example. The war will end with our victory, but in order to win, you, workmen, must produce more. We must have guns, shells, rifles, and bombs in great quantities. Arms and munitions at this moment represent our salvation. Tomorrow, when our factories again produce plows and spades and instruments for agriculture, we shall have the joy of a duty done. Today, and until the barbarians are defeated forever, instruments of war must increase in number under the impulse of your decisive will to win. Loud applause and a demonstration of affection and sympathy. End of Section 4 Section 5 Of Mussolini as revealed in his political speeches no turning back. Speech delivered in the Augustio at Rome, 24th of February, 1918. The speech delivered at the Augustio in Rome may be included among those made by the most fervent patriots to rouse the country to a resolute effort after the Caporetto disaster. It was a summons to resistance and a strong indictment against the heads of the government in Italy, which was responsible for the moral collapse which took place in the army due to the evil influences of blackmail and neutralist parliamentarianism at work in the country. The salient feature of this meeting 
was the leaving of the hall by the generals representing the Corpo d'Armata and the Ministry of War. But it was entirely owing to this meeting of exasperated patriots that the general policy of the then Prime Minister ceased to be lenient to the enemy's sympathizers, and that active resistance paved the way to the victory of the country in arms. I wonder if there is anyone among you who remembers a meeting in favor of intervention in the war that we held three years ago in one of the squares in Rome. We were dispersed by the police, but we were in the right. We moved on, and history moved on with us. Three cities created history, but it does not matter. It is always the cities which create history. The villages are content to endure it. We, after three years of war, notwithstanding Caporetto, solemnly and truly reaffirm all that was deep, pure, and immortal in those days in May. Remember, it was just in the May of 1915 that Italy was not afraid of knowing how to live, because she was not afraid of knowing how to die. The mistake of May. But we made a great mistake then, that we have since paid for bitterly. We, who wished for the war, ought to have taken command of the situation. Loud applause. The Italian people, which is not the plebeian crowd which gets drunk in taverns for twenty centuries of history, have not civilized us for nothing. The Italian people had, even then, a vague apprehension of the dangers which threatened its mission. In the May of 1915, the nation as a whole presented a marvelous concentration of human force. We men of 84, when we forded the upper Isonzo, thought that it was never again to be crossed by the Germans. When we gained the other side, with one accord, we shouted, Long live Italy! Loud applause from the whole assembly, who echoed the cry. It was fine human material which we handed over to those men, who carried on war as if it were a tiresome task more tedious than the rest. We gave it over for a war which, after twenty centuries of history, was the first war of the Italian people. To men who did not understand it, to men who represented the past, to bureaucrats who had spilled much too much ink over the trials and sufferings of the people. But we are here to say to you, Gentlemen, the Germans are on the Piave. The Germans have broken down one gate of the Veneto and are in the process of breaking down the other. The moment has come to see if our hearts are made of steel. Enthusiastic applause. I know these soldiers. Because, as a simple soldier myself, I have lived among them, leading the life of a simple soldier. I have seen them under all the different aspects of military life. I have seen them in the barracks, in the hard, bare military transports while going to the front, in the trenches, in the dugouts under ceaseless bombardment, when the shells rain down death. I have seen them when every heart has stopped beating, awaiting the command of the officer. Over the top! I know them, these sons of Italy. And I tell you, they have not been merely soldiers. They have been saints and martyrs. 
loud burst of applause. The Causes of Caporetto How, then, did Caporetto happen? Let us search our consciences courageously as a great people. Ah, yes. At first, it may have had a military reason. Not later. Later, we were face to face with a gigantic hallucination. Applause. Great words were flashed across the horizon. The formulae of salvation had come from Russia, and from Rome came a fierce outcry against the war, saying that it was a useless massacre. You cannot conceive the profound disturbance this outcry caused in the minds of the multitude. And, as if that were not enough, without anyone having the courage to take summary proceedings against the authors, another sacrilegious message came from Parliament. No more trenches next winter! And, it is true, we are not any longer in the trenches beyond the Azonzo. We are on this side of the Piave. Justice for all. All this was the result of a falsehood that lay at the bottom of our national life. The words political liberty have been said. Ah, liberty to betray, to murder the country, to pour out more blood, as said the man in France. General applause. Cries of long live Clemenceau. This political liberty is a paradox. It is criminal to think that men are requisitioned, dressed, armed, and sent to be killed, whilst every liberty of speech and power of protest is denied them, that they are terribly punished for the slightest act or word not in keeping with given orders, while at the same time, behind, in the secret meeting places, in the clubhouses, of brutalized drunkards, plans are allowed to be matured, and words to be spoken, which are death to the war. Loud general applause. But did you not feel, after the 24th of October, that there were a great change in us, both collectively and individually? Did you not feel that the vultures had torn away the flesh, and fixed their claws in the open wounds. Did you not understand that we were going back to 66? Did you not take into account the danger that the military system of 66 would be accompanied by the same diplomatic maneuvering, which we have not yet expiated? One does not deny one's country. One conquers it! Warm applause. The example of Russia. Take a lesson from what has happened in Russia. The Latin sages used to say that nature does not work by sudden leaps. I think, on the contrary, that she does sometimes. But in Russia, they wanted to make things move fast. They got rid of Tsarism in order to form the Democratic Republic of Rodzianka and Milikov. That was, in itself, a big step, and I pass over the intermediate action of the Grand Duke Michael. But, not satisfied with this republic, they wished to become more socialist, and called for Kerensky. Kerensky went because he was a mere figurehead. Laughter. And now there are other people who still want to make things move too fast. But now the Germans, under the pretense of a future pseudo-democracy, have unmasked their brutal 
and barbarous annexationist projects. At Petrograd, it is said all citizens must dig trenches, and those failing under suspicion of vagabondage or espionage will be shot immediately. An iron policy. But meanwhile, the Germans advance, and I think they are impelled by three motives, military, political, and dynastic. I think that the Hohenzollerns propose to put the Romanovs back on the throne. Well, I don't care if they do. As the Russian people have proved that they don't know how to live under a regime of liberty, let them live in slavery. But, in the meantime, the defection of the Russians increases our task. It is not the moment to bewail idly or to follow a weak policy. I seek ferocious men. I want the fierce man who possesses energy, the energy to smash, the inexorable determination to punish and to strike without hesitation. And the higher the position of the culprit, the better. Loud applause from the assembly which understands the illusion. You send the simple soldier, burdened with a family full of cares, and whom you have never taught anything about the country, to court-martial because he has disobeyed some order. If you put this soldier with his back against the wall, I approve of what you do, because... I am a believer in rigid discipline. But you must not have two kinds of law. If there is a general who infringes the Sachi decree, strike him too. If there is a deputy who, after the experience of Caporetto, says again that this war is a useless massacre, I tell you that he too ought to be arrested and punished. Ovation. Whoever has been to the front and lived in the trenches knows what an effect the reading of certain speeches and parliamentary reports had upon the minds of the soldiers. The poor man in the trenches asked himself, Why must I suffer and die if they are still discussing at Rome whether there ought to be war? If those who are at the head of affairs there do not know whether or not it is a good thing to be fighting? That is deplorable and criminal talk, gentlemen. And now, even after Caporetto, after defeat, irresponsible people are allowed to make public anti-war demonstrations. Loud applause. Ghosts. After Caporetto, men showed themselves again, whom we thought to have swept away forever. But we have driven them back into their holes, because we are still on our legs. Yes, many of our comrades have not come back from the Carso and from the Alps. But we carry their sacred memory in our hearts. I think of the indescribable torture of mind of those men of the Third Armata when they had to abandon the Carso. I think they must have cried out, For what reason, as the result of what unexpected catastrophe, are we forced to abandon these rocks? Because... In the end, one loves the tracks, the stones, the trenches, and the dugouts among which men have lived and suffered. We love the Carso, this heap of stones dotted with little crosses which mark the graves of those fallen in the cause of the liberty of our country. Applause. We love the Carso from which we can view the coveted coastline, the Riviera of our Trieste. 
we still carry, alive and splendid, the torch of the dead, the torch of those who fell in the face of the enemy. And we are not moved by motives of gain. We want clear and explicit recognition of the fact that we have done our duty, and we find ourselves still in the breach, that we may tell this people, in case they have forgotten, that there is no turning back. There is no possibility of choosing. Worry your brains as you will. There is nothing else to be done. Nothing else can be thought of. Until victory. The game is such that we must go on, because there is no other solution than this. Victory or defeat. And it is the life or death of the nation that is at stake. Also, those who assumed power with different ideas, with the intention of mending the situation, have had to change their minds. There is no turning back. We must win. The warning has come from Russia. The Russian rulers tried to turn back and make peace. They have talked for days, weeks, and months without coming to any conclusions, because if Musi Melisam had sent lawyers more or less smart, Prussia had sent armed generals, who from time to time tapped the pavement with their swords so that German rights might be better understood. Then they accepted peace. But Prussia, thirsty for land, the Prussia of the Hohenzollerns, insatiable and implacable, marches into Russia and occupies territory. If there is anybody today who does not wish for peace, who prevents talk of peace, who wants to continue the war, you must not seek him among the people, but at Berlin, in the company of Hindenburg and Ludendorff. These are the enemies of mankind, and to these one does not kneel. No, the Latin race holds itself upright. Ovation We who desired the war and make it our boast that we did so, we who do not go humbly soliciting electoral divisions, we shall not follow the cowardly demagogic example of those who wish to ingratiate themselves with the people. Democracy does not signify dissent. It means assent. It means raising up those who are down. And so, for all the sacred and youthful blood that has been shed, and that we have not forgotten, and for the sake of all that is still to be shed, let us renew the solemn pact of our faith in the certainty of victory. No, Italy will not die, because Italy is immortal. Frantic Applause End of Section 5 Section 6 of Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches The Fatal Victory Speech Delivered at the Teatro Comunale, Bologna, 24th May, 1918 On this occasion, the principal speaker was the editor of Il Popolo d'Italia, who had recovered his physical efficiency after severe wounds received on the Carso and had a real influence in securing victory because of the encouragement he gave to the spirit of resistance within the country. Bologna was then a stronghold of the opponents of war on account of the net of political and syndicalist organization stretching throughout the province, and of the socialist supremacy in the communes and dependent administrations. It is, unfortunately, 
well known that the state had by then ceased exercising any authority other than merely formal in this province. A mark of socialist power, which proves also the profound anti-national feeling of the defeated politicians who today stammer so many lying excuses, is offered by the absolute prohibition of manifestations calculated to glorify the Italian army. Mussolini's speech at the Comunale temporarily reunited the sane sections of Bologna to the rest of Italy, then in great anxiety for her fate and future. Combatants and citizens, will you allow me to pass over without unnecessary delay the polemics which have preceded my coming to this city? If, as says our great poet Carducci, one does not seek for butterflies beneath the arch of Titus, one does not seek them for either beneath the arches of this, our ancient and magnificent town of Bologna, especially as one would probably not find butterflies at all, but bats dazed and frightened by this glorious May sunshine. The form of my speech will not surprise you. In those days, three years ago, all the Italy was conscious of life and possessed of willpower. The only Italy which has a right to transform her chaotic succession of events into history burned with an intense ardor. Our ardor. I have noticed now for some time that there are opportunists who are trying to open a door for eventual responsibilities and who are carefully and laboriously cataloging the reasons why Italy could not remain neutral. Destiny and Will Very well. I admit that there has been fatality. I admit this compulsion, which was the result of a number of causes, which it is useless to dwell upon. But I add that at a certain moment we imprinted the mark of our will upon this concatenation of events, and today, after three years, we are not penitent of what we have done. We leave this weak, spiritual attitude to those who seek applause, seats in Parliament, and personal satisfaction. Those who thoroughly despise, as I do, all parliamentarian and demagogism are far away from all this. What Machiavelli says in Chapter 6 of The Principe, about those who, by their own inherent qualities, attain the position of princes, Moses, Cyrus, Romulus, and Theseus, can be applied not only to the individual, but to the nation. And examining, says the Florentine secretary, their lives and actions, one does not see that they had other fortune than that of the opportunity which gave them the material and enabled them to shape it as seemed best to them, and without that opportunity the virtue of their souls would have been lost, and without that virtue the opportunity would have come in vain. As to the Italian people, in that glorious May, it can be said that without the opportunity of the war the virtue of our people would have been lost, but without this virtue the opportunity of the war would have come in vain. I have found an echo of the thought of Machiavelli in the book of Maeterlinck, the great Belgian poet, the poet who, perhaps more than any of his contemporaries, has given expression to the most delicate and complex movements of the human soul. Maeterlinck, in his book Wisdom and Destiny, admits the existence of a mechanical, external fate, but says that a human being can react against it. On event itself, he says in chapter 8 of this book, is pure water which the fountain pours out over us, and which has not generally in itself either taste, color, or perfume. It becomes beautiful or sad, sweet or bitter, life-giving or mortal, according to the soul which receives it. Thousands of adventures, all of which seem to contain the seeds of heroism, continually happen to those who surround us, whilst no heroism arises when the adventure is over. But Christ met a group of children in his path, an adulteress, a Samaritan, and three times in succession, humanity rose to divine heights. The war has been as a jet of pure water for our nation. It has been deadly for Spain, for instance, but life-giving to us. We desired it. We chose. Before making our choice, we argued and struggled, and the struggle sometimes assumed the aspect of violence. But we won, and now we are proud of those days and are glad to think that the memory of the crowds which filled the streets and squares of our cities disturbs those who were defeated and those who even today, by the most insidious means, try to extinguish the sacred flame and the faith of our people. They accepted this war as one accepts a heavy burden, and their leader, 
followed by the curses of the people, withdrew, like an old feudal lord, to his remote native country, and we can only wish that he will always remain there. Enough of old age. But as I am never tired of repeating, we young men made one fatal mistake then, which we have paid for bitterly. We entrusted this ardent youth of ours to the most grievous old age. When I say old age, I do not establish merely a chronological fact. I think some people are born old, that there are those at twenty who are in mental and physical decline, whereas some men, the marvelous tiger of France, for instance, at seventy, have all the vibration and fire of a virile youth. I speak of the old men who are old men, who are behind the times, who are encumbrances. They neither understood nor realized the fundamental truths underlying the war. Besides the people, the meaning of this war in its historical aspect and development has been perceived by two classes of men, the poets and the industrial world. By the poets, because their extreme sensitivities, they grasp truths which remain half-veiled to the ordinary person, and by the industrial world, because it understands that this war is the war of machines. Between the two, let us also put the journalists, who have had enough of the poet in them not to belong to the industrial world, and are enough of the industrial world not to be poets. I speak of the great journalists, who keep their ears open, on alert, to catch the vibrations from the outside world. The journalist has sometimes foreseen what those responsible, alas, have recognized too late. Quality versus quantity. This war has so far been one of quantity. Now it is realized that the masses do not beat the masses. An army does not vanquish an army. Quantity does not overcome quantity. The problem must be faced from another point of view, that of quality. This war, which began by being tremendously democratic, is now tending to become aristocratic. Soldiers are becoming warriors. A selection is being made from the armed mass. The struggle, now carried on almost exclusively in the air, has lost the characteristics it had in 1914. The first novelist who foresaw the problems of the War of Quality was Wells. Read his book, The War on Three Fronts. It is in this book that he advised the exploitation of the quality of the Latin and Anglo-Saxon races. Because, whereas the Germans only work in close formation, only give good results through the automation of the masses, the Latin feels the joy of personal audacity, the fascination of risk, and has the taste for adventure. Which taste, says Wells, is limited in Germany to the descendants of the feudal nobility, while, with us, it is to be found also among the people. Another truth which those responsible realized late was that, in order to win the armies, the people must be won. That is to say, that the armies must be taken in the rear. This would be difficult where Germany was concerned, as she is ethnically, politically, and morally compact. But, we are face to face with an enemy against whom we could have acted in this way from the very first. We ought to have penetrated the mosaic of the Austrian state. A great people. Among the peoples who cannot be taken in the rear by surprise is ours. My praise is sincere. The people in the trenches are great, and those who have not fought are great. For deficiency, you must look among those old men of whom I spoke just now. I have lived among our brave soldiers in the trenches, and listened to them talking in their little groups. I have seen them during the bad times and in epic moments of enthusiasm, and when, after the sad 24th of October, there was a certain distrust of them, I would not allow it, because it seemed to me impossible that the soldiers, who had won battles in circumstances more difficult than those prevailing in any other theater of war, had become all at once weak cowards who fled at the mere crackling of a machine gun. And it was not so, because if it had been, no river would have stopped the invading forces. And if we'd stopped them on the Piave, it means we could have resisted also on the Isonzo. Applause. I was reading in the train last night a book of poems written in the trenches by a captain, Arturo Apigati. The literature of the war is the only readable literature, but it must have been written by men who have really been at the front. In this verse, I recognized my one-time fellow soldiers, the humble and great soldiers of our war. Here it is. Col vecchio sus magico guardo, il dovere 
Mimi de Chayo, Yin Kongshi, Anke Sojoga, Ben Kene, El Bentil, Il Nome. Ecco, essi, la madre defendono, ed è la madre di tutti. Essono essi, la guara, essono essi, la fronte, sono essi la vittoria. De loro el meti farei, spica il volo la gloria. Isi martiri i sante, sono la roica patria, isi, i fanti. But the highest praise of the people in arms is contained in the thousand bulletins of the supreme command. The unarmed also deserve praise, both those in the cities, inevitably nervous and restless by reason of the association of thousands of human beings and the context of thousands of temperaments, and those in the country. From the, from the Valle Padana, to the, Tavoerle de Lepulie, from the vine-clad hills of Montferrat to the plains of Concadoro, the houses of the peasants stand empty, and with the houses, the stables. The women have seen the father and the son depart together, the thoughtful territorial of over forty and the adventurous youth. It is useless to expect from the humble people of the proletariat a highly developed sense of nationality. It cannot possess what we have never done anything to cultivate. From the people who have exchanged the spade for the gun, we simply ask for obedience. And the Italian people, the people of the country and of the factories, obey. A sad episode. Some signs of restlessness are not enough to spoil this picture. It had been said that we should not hold out six months. That at the announcement of the names of the dead, the families would rebel. That the sight of the maimed at the street corners would rouse the people to action. Three years have now passed. Three long years. The mothers of the fallen take a sacred pride in their grief. The maimed do not ask to be called glorious and refuse to be pitied. Food is scarce, but the people still resist. The troop trains go to the front adorned with flowers, as in May of 1915. The dignity and peace in the towns and in the country is simply marvelous. The national crisis, which lasted from August to October of 1917, and which is summed up in the two names of Turin and Caporetto, has been, in a certain sense, salutary. It was the repercussions of the great crisis which hurled Russia into the abyss. The Russian Tragedy Was there any definite motive in the Leninist policy which led Russia to make the painful, forced, and shameful peace of Brest? Yes, there was! The Massimalists really believe in the possibility of revolution by contagion. They hoped to infect the Germans with a Massimalist Basilis. They did not succeed. Germany is refractory. The very minoritaries are far from proclaiming themselves Bolshevists. And more, these minoritaries, who ought to represent the fermenting yeast, are continually losing ground. In three elections, there have been three overwhelming defeats. The majoritaries triumph. They are the same now as in August of 1914, accomplices of Panermanism. They want to win. After brest litovsk the socialists lay low. After the peace of Bucharest, they kept silence. We have seen what have been the results in Russia of the Leninist gospel. We have seen how the German socialists, who accepted neither annexations nor indemnities and the right of the people to decide their own fate, have interpreted this doctrine. The Germans took possession of 540,000 square kilometers of territory in Russia, with a population of 55 million. Then they went on to Romania and plundered her. If the peace of Brest-Litovsk was shameful for Russia, the peace of Bucharest was not. The Romanians were taken in the rear and could not resist. In the meantime, Chicherian, the commissioner of foreign affairs, made the wireless work. A cynic might remark that if the Roman Republic had a Cicero in a critical hour of her history, Russia has a Chichirin, whom, contrary to the former, nobody takes seriously, because it is impossible to take seriously those who do not know how to take up arms in the defense of their own rights. The Russian experiment has helped us enormously, both from the socialist and the political points of view. It has opened many eyes which had persistently remained closed. It must be realized that if Germany wins, 
complete and certain ruin awaits us. Germany has not changed her fundamental instincts. They are the same as those which Tacticus describes in perfection in his Germania, in these words. The Germans do not live in villages, but in separate houses, set wide apart the better to protect them against fire. To shield themselves from the cold, they live in underground dwellings covered with manure or close themselves in the skins of small animals, of which they have a great number. Strong in war, but persistent drunkards and gamblers, armed with spears and well supplied with horses, they prefer to gain wealth, when it suits them, by violence rather than the working of their lands. In his De Vita Julie Agricola, this Roman writer notes a contrast between the Germans and the Britons 19 centuries ago, which is still the same today. That is, that while the Britons fight for the defense of their country and their homes, the Germans fight for avarice and lust. Driven once to Legnano, have resumed their march beyond the Rhine, and are preparing once more to take up the offensive against us. But the lust of which Kuhlmann speaks will not carry the Germans beyond the Piave. We are on our feet. According to German calculations, the Italian nation, as the result of Caporetto, ought to fall into a state of chaos. Instead, it is on its feet. What vicissitudes may not this last phase of the war bring with it? Will Germany, who has not been able to beat us by ourselves, beat the formidable combination of nations which faces her? We are one with France, whose soldiers have performed wonders of heroism. And this France, which we knew so little, because we had looked for her only in the cabarets of Montmartre, had not frequented by Frenchmen at all, but by the adventurers from all over the world, has written for us the most splendid pages of heroic deeds. She has known how to rid herself of insidious dangers, to give the death blow to the plotters of treachery, both great and small, and to make the rifles of the executionary squadrons crackle, a sound which, to one who loves his country, is sweeter than the harmonies of a great opera. Also, we, in Italy, inexorably, where traitors are concerned, if we are to defend our soldiers from attack from behind. Where the existence of the nation and of millions of men is involved, there cannot and must not be a moment's hesitation about sacrificing the lives of one, ten, or a hundred men. We are one with England, who repeats the words of Nelson. England expects that every man this day will do his duty. And we are one with the United States. This internationalism, the real, true, and lasting internationalism, even if it has not got the formulas, dogmas, and chrism of socialism to make it official. It is in the trenches where soldiers of different nationalities have crossed 6,000 leagues of ocean to come and die in Europe. You must allow me to be optimistic about the outcome of the war. We shall win because the United States cannot lose. England cannot lose. France cannot lose. The United States has a population of 110 millions. One single levy can produce a million recruits. America, like England, knows that the wealth of the society is at stake. As long as we are in this company, there is no danger of a ruinous peace. Not to arrive at the goal of peace means to be crushed. But when we arrive there, we too can look the enemy in the face and say that we too small, despised people, army of mandolinists, have held out to the end, wept, suffered, but resisted, and have thus the right to a just and lasting peace. Convalescence I am an optimist, and see the Italy of tomorrow through rose-colored spectacles. Enough of the Italy of the hotel keeper, goal of the idol with their odious Baedekers in their hands. Enough of dusting old plasterwork. We are, and we wish to be, a nation of producers. We are a people who will expand without aiming at conquest. We shall gain the world's respect by means of our industries and our work. It will be the august name of Rome which will still guide our forces in the Adriatic, the Gulf of the Mediterranean, and in the Mediterranean, which forms the communication between three continents. Those who have been wounded know what a convalescence means. 
There comes a day when the surgeon no longer takes his ruthless but life-giving knife from the tray, no longer tortures the suffering flesh. The danger of infection is over, and you feel yourself reborn. A second youth begins. Things, men, the voice of a woman, the caress of a child, the flowering of a tree, everything gives you the ineffable sensation of a return. New blood surges through your veins and fills you with a feverish desire to work. The Italian people, too, will have its convalescence, and it will be a competition for reconstruction after destruction. The flag of the disabled is a symbol of change in their moral and spiritual life. Just think that certain rascals thought to take advantage of them for their infamous speculations. But the disabled answered, We will not lend ourselves to this shameful game. We do not intend to accept from your charity and sympathy help which would humiliate us. And they do not curse their fate. They do not complain, even if they are without an arm or a leg. Even those who have lost the divine light of their eyes hold their peace. In vain, the enemy hoped to profit by the state of mind of those people. They reply to this by saying that all they had they gave for their country, and today they do not wish to be a burden upon her, and so they work and train themselves and give further proof of their devotion to the sacred cause. The Returning Battalions I no longer see relegated to some far future time, the day upon which the banners of the disabled will precede the torn and glorious standards of the regiments, and around the standards will be collected the veterans and the people, and there will be the shadow of our dead, from those who fell on the Alps to those who were buried beyond the Isonzo, from those who stormed Gorizia to those who were mowed down between Hermanda and the mysterious Timavo or upon the banks of the Piave. All this sacred phalanx we sum up in three names. Cesare Battisti, who wished deliberately to face martyrdom, and who was never so noble as when he offered his neck to the Habsburg executioner. Giacomo Vinicion, who left the austere halls of your Athenaeum in order to go and meet his death upon the road to Trieste. And Filippino Corridoni, born of the people, a fighter for the people, and who died for the people on the first rocky ridges of the Carso. The returning battalions will move with the slow and measured tread of those who have lived and suffered much, and who have seen innumerable others suffer and die. They will say, we shall say. Here upon the track, which leads back to the harvest field, here in the factory, which now forges the instruments of peace, here in the tumultuous city and the silent country, now that the duty was done and the goal reached, let us set up the symbol of our new right. Away with shadows, we the survivors, we the returned, vindicate our right to govern Italy, not to her destruction and decay, but in order to lead her ever higher, ever on, to make her, in thought and deed, worthy to take her place among the great nations, which will build up the civilization of the world of tomorrow. End of Section 6 Section 7 of Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches In honor of the American people, speech delivered at Milan on the occasion of the popular demonstration of 8th April, 1918. Benito Mussolini, who on that occasion was specially entrusted with the task of addressing the President of the United States on behalf of the Lombard Association of Journalists, had prepared the mind of the Milanese eight months before by a speech delivered in the Piazza Conduso, extolling the generous and brotherly effort of the great and vigorous American people. Citizens, time does not allow long speeches. I do not speak of time by the clock, but of historical time, which for some weeks has quickened its beat. Today, throughout Italy, demonstrations are taking place worthy of this unique moment in the history of humanity. Applause when they took the field against Barbarossa, at Rome an imposing demonstration is in progress beneath the shadow of the imperial walls of the Colosseum, while here the people of Milan, by their numbers and enthusiasm, express the keen sympathy they feel for the noble American democracy. It was a year ago today that America, having loyally waited for the Germans to come to their senses, unsheathed her sword and joined the battle. 
Applause. Six thousand leagues of ocean have not prevented the United States from fulfilling her definite duty. The importance of her intervention does not consist only in the fact that America gives us, and will give us, men, ammunition, and provisions. There is something deeper in the intimate reassurance given us as men and civilized people, as America would never have embraced our cause if she had not been firmly convinced of the right and justice of it. Applause Citizens, it is for us a source of pride and satisfaction to be associated with 23 other nations in this war against Prussian militarism. But it must also be a satisfaction for the United States to fight side by side with a great and powerful England, which does not tremble before the varying chances of war, beside a France which is almost sublime in her heroism. Applause. And beside the new Italy, which has now definitely taken her place in the world struggle. Applause. As Italy discovered America, so America and the rest of the New World must discover Italy, not only in the great towns, pulsating with life and humming with industry, but also in the country, where the humble laborers wait with quiet resignation for the dawn of a victorious and just peace to appear on the horizon. There cannot be anybody now, even the most ignorant, who can sincerely believe that Germany did not want the war, and that Germany does not wish to continue the war in order that she may turn the world into a lot of horrible Prussian barracks. Applause and cries of death to Germany. This is our conviction, and also the conviction of the Americans, a great people numbering more than a hundred million, who have a vast wealth at their command, and who have already submitted themselves to the magnificent discipline of war. An old story comes to mind when Christopher Columbus turned the prows of his three poor little ships towards unknown lands and far-off shores, there were those who called him mad and moonstruck. And certainly sometime during those three months of wandering a sense of despair invaded the hearts of those men lost in the midst of the unknown ocean. But one morning the crew up aloft saw something new upon the horizon. It was a dark, vague line. They shouted, Land! Land! And three months of misery were forgotten in one delirious moment. The day will come when from our blood-stained trenches will arise another such cry. The cry of victory! Victory! And there will be the right and just peace for all the nations. Citizens, on behalf of the Committee of the Wounded and Disabled Soldiers, I thank you for your solemn demonstration. And I ask you to join with me in giving three cheers for America and for Italy. Warm applause and cheers. End of section 7. Section 8 of Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches. The League of Nations. Speech delivered at Milan, 20th October, 1918. Immediately after the end of the war, a group of journalists and politicians, belonging for the most part to the Republican and Radical Democracy, took the initiative in a movement supporting the future work of the League of Nations. Later, however, this initiative had to be abandoned by those who were loyal to victory, because it seemed clear to them that the pseudo-idealism of the Allies would prejudice the legitimate interests of the Italian nation. The following speech, however, shows clearly the generosity of Italian ex-soldiers, disappointed by the realism of other countries' national aspirations. The Executive Committee of the Wounded and Disabled Soldiers has asked me to speak on the order of the day expressing support of the idea of the League of Nations, which, already preconceived in Italy, is now so nobly advocated by President Wilson, and which proclaims the determination of the Italian people to cooperate effectively in bringing about its realization. I shall do so shortly, as the question is not new, but is already understood throughout the country. The disabled soldiers have taken the initiative, and it is significant, as only those who have suffered most from the war have the right to say what peace ought to be, not those who have willfully opposed it and would have led us to defeat, or, not wishing that the people should suffer defeat, to continuous war. This is the hour particularly suited to the discussion of these problems. Already a League of Nations seems to be in the process of realization. In the trenches, the different peoples are mixed up and are associating with each other. The humblest peasant, dreaming of return to his native village after the hard experiences of the trenches, has widened his spiritual horizon and, for a time, breathes a world atmosphere. 
In the other nations, the question has already come under discussion in the papers, the universities, and the parliaments. It could be said that Italy was behindhand, but we might reply that in a certain sense we have forestalled the others. There have been epochs in our history when Italian thought has been almost too universal, but I think perhaps at those times the universality of our literature, our philosophy, our art, of our spirit, in fact, was our highest and noblest title to greatness. But, without returning to the Middle Ages, two men of the 19th century, Catanio and Massini, proved that Italian thought led, and that other nations followed the furrow we were the first to plow. This war may be divided into two periods, the first, from the outbreak of hostilities to the American intervention, the second, from the American intervention up to today. In the first, the war has a national and territorial character. The names of Metz, Trento, Fiume, and Zara occur frequently, and can be said to sum up our aims. The territorial questions come first. The systemized jurisdiction of the world is not yet spoken of. The war is worldwide in its direct and indirect repercussion in as far as England has already made use of her colonies, since Australians and Indians came to fight in Europe. But it is not yet worldwide in its extension and aims. The second period began with the April of 17. Already, in the first period, English politicians had begun to disregard the territorial problems. But this process was shaped, hurried on, and definitely settled by the intervention of America. But, in my modest opinion, the national and territorial questions must not be underrated too much. That would be to play into the hands of the anti-war agitators and the Germans. These are questions of justice. It is a good thing to remember that Wilson, in all his messages, though he certainly made a transposition of values, never failed to establish that the vindication of national rights, without which the settlement of Europe and the world of tomorrow in general could have no definite meaning. When we speak of a League of Nations, we must take into account certain dispositions. Cesare Lombroso used to divide men into two categories, the Mysoneists and the Philoneists. The Mysoneists, who accept the revealed truths, lean upon them and sleep upon them. The Philoneists, who are restless, impatient spirits, and as necessary to the world as the wheels and shafts to a cart. For the first, the so-called kingdom of the impossible has always extensive boundaries, but the war has enormously reduced that kingdom. That which yesterday was a misty, fantastic utopia, today has become a reality and fact. Our enemies talk too much about the League of Nations. There are furious Wilsonites of the latest kind in Austria and in Germany. Now I must say that seeing this kind of people bleeding like lambs makes a certain impression on me. The simile is that of a Republican German paper printed at Bern. They are the same who burnt the cities of Belgium, who sank ships without leaving a trace, or grave orders to that effect. They are the same who carried off men and women in their retreat. They shout, League of Nations! But we cannot be mixed up with them. There is evidently an underlying motive, but they will be unmasked by the victorious armies of the Entente. Some people say, would not this League of Nations be a substitute for victory? No! On the other hand, it presupposes victory. Wilson has talked of absolute victory. It is said, in a socialist review, that a League of Nations is impossible if the Allies gain a military victory, because the desire for revenge would lurk in the depths of the German mind. Now, there are three hypotheses as regards the way in which the conflict may end. The first is the victory of the enemy, and this has already fallen through. If this had come about, there would not have been a League of Nations, but a master at Berlin and slaves in the rest of Europe, which would then have become a German colony. The second is a war which ends in neither victory nor defeat, and this is the most repugnant and inhuman of all, as it would leave all the problems unsolved and give a peace which was only a truce. The third is the solution which is now shaping itself gloriously upon the horizon, our victory. There is no danger of the spirit of revenge being fostered by the Germans tomorrow, because we allies in war would remain allies in peace. Germany will find herself face to face with the same coalition which defeated her, and will have to resign herself to the fate accompli. The League of Nations will be formed without Germany, against Germany, or with Germany, when she has expiated her crime by being defeated. Some people say, does it not seem very dangerous to go back to universality after the experiences of the past? Ernest Renan must have been up against this problem when he wrote, 
The nation which entertains problems of the religious and social order is always weak. Every country which dreams of a kingdom of God lives on general ideas and carries out work in the interests of the universe, sacrifices through this its own particular destiny, and weakens and destroys its efficiency as a territorial power. It was thus with Judea, Greece, and Italy. It will, perhaps, be thus with France. Renan was a great man, but his prophecy has not been fulfilled. France, during the 19th century, entertained universal ideas, but with the outbreak of war, she recovered her national spirit. Internationalism may be dangerous when a single nation advocates it, but today all the nations of the world are seeking each other in order to lay the foundations of a lasting and pacific means of coexistence. Besides this, the racial, historical, and moral sense of every nation has been developed by the war. It is not a paradox, but a reality that the war, while it has made us find ourselves and exalted the national spirit, has, at the same time, carried us beyond those boundaries, which we have defended and conquered. There is no danger of the leveling of the national spirit as the result of contact with other nations. Solid foundations are needed for national unity, and for this reason, the condition of the working classes must be raised. No nation can become greater in which there are enormous masses condemned to the conditions of life of prehistoric humanity. Another paradox of this war is that the nations fighting against the Germans have not yet formed a peace alliance. The peace manifesto to the peoples of the world ought to have come from Versailles. This could help, among other things, to make the German crisis more acute. It has not been done yet. The people intuitively felt the necessity. Sometimes truths are arrived at more quickly by intuition than by reasoning, and the people felt that that was the path to follow. And we are upon that path today. Not long ago, Klimasu said that the liberation of France must be the liberation of humanity. It is true that to put the idea of the League of Nations into practice would present difficulties, especially at first. According to me, the problems which will have to be faced and solved are of a political, economic, military, and colonial order. In a month's time, you will have reports upon these subjects, and I do not wish to tire you with hasty anticipations. We have arrived at a decisive point in history. While we have gathered here, the battle is raging. There are millions and millions of men who are fighting their last fight. Let us swear that all this has not been in vain, but that these sacrifices must mark a new phase in the history of humanity. Let us say to ourselves, that all that can be tried will be tried in order to make the purple flower of liberty spring from the blood shed in the cause of freedom, and that justice shall reign sovereign over all the peoples of the renewed world. End of Section 8 Section 9 of Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches In Celebration of Victory Speech delivered at Milan, 11th November, 1918 Before the Monument of the Jinka Giornate Milan, notwithstanding its multicolored local socialism, had ever remained the burning heart of the country's resistance and spent herself lavishly for the war. On the morrow of the memorable day of Vittorio Veneto, she gave herself up to unrestrained manifestations of patriotic joy. Benito Mussolini, the ardent advocate of intervention in the harassing times gone by, the indomitable fighter in the Carso trenches, and the fervent advocate of resistance in the hour in which the enemy's friends were crying for peace at any price, Benito Mussolini may well be considered as one of the principal artificers of victory. The people of Milan felt this in the triumphant rejoicings, and the editor of Il Popolo d'Italia was acclaimed by public gratitude for his part in the Union of Hearts. My brothers of the trenches, citizens, I have never before felt my inefficacy as an orator as deeply as I do now, in the face of the greatness of the events and your memorable and imposing manifestation. What can I say to you when this manifestation is already more than a speech, a hymn, more than a hymn, an epos? We have arrived at this day after many hardships. I see here, gathered round the monument of Jinka Giornate, which is the altar of Milan, those who fought first and last, those of the trenches who are the survivors of the sacrifice of devotion, who marked with their blood the destinies of the country, and the disabled who feel themselves no longer maimed since Italy has become great. I see beside them the refugees, who will soon return to their lands and deserted hearths. I remember what I said last year, 
we must love these brothers of ours, warm them by our firesides, and still more in our hearts. And I see the peoples of Milan join together like all the Italian people in a superb act of love. How many different events in the course of a year? Do you remember these days a year ago? Do you remember last year at the Scala when we swore that the Germans should not pass the Piave? And they did not pass. And the then line of resistance became afterwards the line of advance towards victory. Even in the darkest hours, I did not despair, and I paid homage to the fighters. We saw in those days the first Poilus and Tommies. It was the Entente coming to cement the alliance in our trenches. After a year of faith and sacrifice, has come victory. We think with gratitude of the fine leaders who led us on to victory, but also, still more, of the anonymous mass of soldiers, our marvelous people, who resisted the invasion on the Piave, and from the Piave sprang forward to rout the enemy. Remember it here, here where we held the first meeting for war, here with Filippino Corradoni. The crowd give a prolonged ovation to the memory of Filippino Corradoni. We wanted the war because we were obliged to want it, because it was imposed by historical necessity. Today we have realized all our ideals. We have secured our national aims. The Italian flag today flies from the Brenia to Trieste and Fiume and Italian Zara. We did not know then that there were Italian infantry on the other side of the Adriatic. Now, in all the cities and villages on the eastern shore, the Italians have planted the flag of their country, because that shore, which is Italian, must remain Italian. We have also accomplished the international aims of our war. When we said, four years ago, that the red flag must wave over the castle at Potsdam, the dream appeared madness. Today the Kaiser has fled, and with the passing of the Hohenzollerns passes militarism. The most magnificent political panorama which history records unfolds itself before the eyes of the astonished world. Empires, kingdoms, and autocracies crumble like castles built with cards. Austria no longer exists. Tomorrow there will no longer be imperialist Germany. We, with the sacrifice of our blood, have given the German people liberty while the German people have made a holocaust of their blood in order to deliver us over to the chain of imperialism and military slavery. Upon the ruins of the old world is outlined the dream of a League of Nations. Victory must also see the realization of the aims of war within the country, that is to say, the redemption of labor. From now onwards, the Italian people must be the arbiters of their destinies, and labor must be redeemed from speculation and misery. Citizens, at Trento, there is a statue of Dante with his hand outstretched towards the Alps. It seemed before that the reproach of the great poet, I, Servitalia, di Dolores Tello, nave senza no quiero in tempesta, rang out admonishing the country. But Italy today is no longer a slave. She is the mistress of herself and her future. She is no longer a rudderless ship in a storm, because a glorious horizon has been opened up by her victory. And the people are the rudder of the ship, which, between three seas and three continents, sails serenely and securely towards the port of supreme justice in the light of the redeemed humanity of tomorrow. Prolonged applause. End of section 9. Section 10 of Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches Part 3. Mussolini, the Fascista Friend of the People, 20th March, 1919 Workmen's Rights After the War Speech delivered 20th March, 1919, before the workmen of Dalvine The episode of syndicalist strife, during which the present Prime Minister addressed a crowd meeting of iron workers, is often recalled as a kind of reproach by Italian socialists. They would like to attribute to Mussolini and to fascista syndicalism the initial responsibility for that dark period in our national life which had its dramatic expression in the occupation of the factories. But the methods of protest adopted by the patriotic Italian workmen of Dalmine, Bergamo, 
Although primitive on account of the moral immaturity and technical incapacity of the proletariat at that time, were provoked by the insolence of employers. For the rest, the protest was kept within the bounds of correct and calm expression, a significant item in the story, which reveals the state of mind of the workers is the following. Tricolor flags, which were then frequently insulted by organizations of workmen under the thumb of the Socialist Party, flew from all chimney tops during the occupation of Dalminay Works, which, while in the workshops below, the work itself throbbed cheerfully and briskly. I have often asked myself, after the four years of terrible though victorious war in which our bodies and minds have been engaged, the masses of the people would return to move, to move in the same old tracks as before, or whether they would have the courage to change their direction. Dalminay has answered, The order of the day voted by you on Monday is a document of enormous historical importance, which will and must give a general direction to the line taken by all Italian labor. The intrinsic significance of your action is clearly set forth in the order of the day. You have acted on the grounds of class, but you have not forgotten the nation. You have spoken for the Italian people, and not only for those of your class of metal workers. In the immediate interests of your category, you might have caused a strike in the old style, the negative and destructive style. But, thinking of the interests of the people, you have inaugurated the creative strike which does not interrupt production. You could not deny the nation after having fought for her when half a million of men have given their lives for her. The nation for which this sacrifice has been made cannot be denied, because she is a glorious and victorious reality. You are not the poor, the humiliated, the rejected, as the old rhetorical sayings of the socialist would have you be. You are the producers, and it is in this capacity that you vindicate your right to treat the industrial owners as equals. You are teaching some of them, especially those who have ignored all that has occurred in the world in the last four years, that for the figure of old industrial magnate, odious and grasping, must be substituted that of the industrial captain. You have not been able to prove your capacity for creation on account of the shortness of time and the conditions made for you by the industrial leaders, but you have proved your good will, and I tell you that you are on the right road because you are freed from your protectors and have chosen from among yourselves the men who are to direct you and represent you, and to them only you have entrusted the guardianship of your rights. The future of the proletariat is a question of willpower and capacity, not of willpower only and not of capacity only, but of both together. You are free from the yoke of political intrigue. Your applause tells me that this is true. I am proud of having fought for intervention. If it were necessary, I would carve in capital letters upon my forehead, so that all cowards might see that I was among those in the glorious May of fifteen who demanded that this, the shame of the neutral Italy of those days would cease. Now that the war is over, I, who have been in the trenches and witnessed daily for long months the revelation in every sense of the valor of the sons of Italy, I say, today, that it is necessary to go out and meet the returning workers and those who were no shirkers, who labored in the factories with minds open to the necessities of the hour, and those who do not see this necessity involved by the new order of things or deny it, are either stupid or deluded. I have never asked, and today less than ever, anything from you or anybody, and so I have no anxiety or misgivings as to the effect that my words will have upon you. I tell you that your actions have been original, and is worthy on account of the motives of sympathy which inspired it. Another observation. Upon the flagstaff of your building, you have run up your flag, which is the tricolor, and around it you have fought your battle. You have done well. The national flag is not merely a rag, even if it has been dragged in the mud by the bourgeoisie or by their representatives. It still remains the symbol of the sacrifice of thousands and thousands of men. For its sake, from 1821 to 1918, innumerable bands of men suffered privation, imprisonment, and the gallows. Around it during these years, while it was the rallying point of our nation, was shed the blood of the flower of your youth, of our sons and brothers. It seems to me that I have said enough. As regards your rights, which are just and sacred, I am with you. I have always distinguished the mass which works from the party which assumes the right Nobody knows why of representing it. I have sympathy with all the working classes, not excluding the General Federation of Labor, 
though I feel myself drawn more towards the Italian Union of Workmen. But I say that I shall not cease fighting against the party which during the war was the instrument of the Kaiser. They wish at your expense to try their monkey-like experiments, which are only an imitation of Russia. But you will succeed, sooner or later, in exercising essential functions in modern society, though the political dabblers of the bourgeoisie and the semi-bourgeoisie must not make stepping stones of your aspirations so as to arrive at their winning little games. They may have said what they like to you about me. I do not mind. I am an individualist who does not seek companions on his journey. I find them, but I do not seek them. While this despicable speculation of the jackals rages, you, obscure workers of Dalmine, have cleared the way. It is labor which speaks in you, and not an idiotic dogma or an intolerable creed. It is that labor which in the trenches established its right to be long, no longer considered as labor, necessarily accompanied by poverty and despair because it must bring joy, pride in creation, and the conquest of free men in the great and free country of Italy, within and without her boundaries. End of section 10. Section 11 of Mussolini is revealed in his political speeches. Section 11, 5th February 1920. Sacrifice, work, and production. Speech delivered at Milan, 5th February 1920, before the Fascio Milanese Combattimento. If it were possible, before voting on orders of the day, to put into practice the system of democracy, we ought to have summoned the assembly. But when events follow one another with lightning speed, it is not possible to carry out this system of absolute democracy. We have, therefore, voted the orders of the day, and wait for you to ratify them. We have brought forward three, and done so from a point of view essentially fascista. I dare to say that one is born a fascista, and that it is difficult to become one. All the other parties and associations argue on a basis of dogmas and from the standpoint of definite preconceptions and infallible ideals. We, being an anti-party, have no preconceptions. We are not like the socialists, who always think that the working masses are in the right, and we're not like the conservatives, who think that they are always in the wrong. We have got above all this, and have the privilege of moving on the ground of pure objectivity. Voting these, orders of the day, after a serious and elaborate discussion, we have kept before us three classes of facts or elements. First, we have kept in mind the general interests of the nation, particularly as regards the recent strikes. Secondly, we have considered the subject of production, because if we kill production, if today we render sterile the fount of economic activity, tomorrow there will be universal poverty. Thirdly, we have been guided in voting these orders of the day by our disinterested love for the working classes. All must sacrifice themselves. I agree with those who recommend the spirit of sacrifice also to the working classes. I agree, because we do not only say to the working men that they must wait, while still working, for better times to come in order to break the vicious circle in which they move. We also say that, generally speaking, capital must be controlled. In this connection I announce to you that in a short time a manifesto will be issued, in which it will be once more asserted that, in order to solve the financial problem, it is necessary to resort to a threefold measure. First, the partial confiscation of all wealth over a certain amount. Secondly, the heavy taxation of inheritance, and thirdly, the confiscation of super-war profits. No pessimism. I am not a bit pessimistic about the future of the Italian nation. If I were, I should retire from public life. But as I am profoundly optimistic, I think that with the January strikes over, we have passed the critical period of our social crisis. You will tell me that February has not brought much light. We have the strike of 50,000 textile workers belonging to the Popular Party, which shows that black Bolshevism has the same destructive and anti-social character as the other Bolshevism. But it seems to me that the social crisis is stabilising itself while awaiting solution. If we can get over these next six or eight months without catastrophe, if we can increase our trade with the East, if the workmen can be made to understand that we cannot take our money there but must send our manufactured goods, and that only thus will the high rate of living be diminished, 
because only from the east come those raw materials of which we stand in need. It is certain that the workmen will repudiate the more destructive than constructive weapon of strikes, and settle down to serious work. Sure Repentance Our position as regards the syndicalist movement is not reactionary, as has been said by some purposely malicious adversary. I wrote some very bitter articles during the strikes, but these articles, which were so incriminating, brought me approval which was very significant. If there is a man in the Italian Union of Workmen who has worked seriously, it is the Republican Carlo Bazzi, who has recently joined the Syndicate of Cooperation, which is necessary counterwork to the Socialist Cooperative Movement. Now Bazzi wrote my brother a letter, which contained these words. I fully subscribe to Mussolini's article, You are immortal, Kagoya. This is enough for me. But at the same time, I do not require that everybody shall agree with me, and that there shall be no one who differs. I am always ready to persuade myself of my mistake when I am in the wrong, but I do not think that our work can be valued now. I think that within five or six months' time, there will be quite a few socialists who will recognise that I am the only socialist that there has been in Italy for the last five years. And I am not being paradoxical, even if I add that the Socialist Party on the whole is detestable. I think, too, that a great many elements of the centre and followers of Tarati are beginning to recognise it even now, and that in a short time the working classes will admit that the days of 15th April and 20 to 21st of July, with all our violent opposition, were providential and miraculous, because, having put the stake between the wheels of the runaway coach, we prevented that what has happened in Hungary should happen in Italy. Production Necessary Today it is said that poverty should not be socialised, but that is what we said two years ago. Just as today it is said that there must be increased production, as we said two years ago. And when history comes to be written, as it will be shortly, then our work will be judged very differently from that of the socialists and the responsible elements in the working classes. The discussion of this evening, I think, might end with a declaration upon these four points. 1. The meeting ratifies the orders of the day voted by the Executive Committee and the Central Committee. 2. The meeting reaffirms its solidarity with the just demands of the postal telegraphists and the railway men and all the state employees, because I've never been tired of repeating that we are against the strike, but not against the demands of the staff. 3. The meeting votes a warning to the government that the working of the state services must be made really efficient, whether it be by removing the bureaucratic management or by industrialisation. And I think that autonomous organisations can be formed of the postal, telephone and railway services, in which the agents would have a large direct representation. 4. Finally, the meeting votes its sympathy with all the working class elements who are agitating against the Socialist Party and urges them to gather together in a compact body so that, though hitherto it has not been possible, from today onwards it may be possible, even in Italy, to live and work and struggle without being slaves to the new tyrannies, without the necessity of being compelled to become a mere member in a flock of membership cardholders like a flock of sheep. End of section 11. Section 12 of Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches. 24th May, 1920. We are not against labor, but against the Socialist Party, in as far as it remains anti-Italian. Speech delivered at Milan, 24th May, 1920, at the Second National Fascista Meeting. The following is not a conventional speech, but represents a sincere act of faith, made in the darkest hour through which Italy passed. The hour which followed upon the sweeping electoral and political triumphs of 1919, when communal and provincial administrations were divorced from the liberal policies. The subversive newspapers of the day regarded that second fascista meeting as a useless attempt at galvanization, since the movement, which was destined later to conquer the state, seemed then merely to lead to a blind alley. Such is the futility of newspaper prophecies. Words at times can be facts. Let us act, then, in such a way that all the words we utter now may be potential facts today and reality tomorrow. Five years ago, at this time, 
popular enthusiasm burst forth in all the streets and squares of the towns of Italy. Looking back now and studying the documents of those times, I can state with certainty and a clear conscience that the cause of intervention was not taken up by the so-called middle classes, but by the best and healthiest part of the Italian people. And when I say the people, I mean also the proletariat, because nobody could imagine that the thousands and thousands of citizens who followed Corradoni were all from the middle class. I remember that one agricultural chamber of labor, that of Parma, declared in favor of intervention on the part of Italy with a great majority, and even admitting that the war was a mistake, which I do not admit. He who scorns the sacrifice which has been made is despicable. If you want to go back and make a critical examination, I am ready to argue with anybody and to maintain, first, that the war was desired by the central powers, as has been confessed by the politicians of the German Republic and confirmed by the imperial archives. Secondly, that Italy could not have remained neutral. And thirdly, that if she had, she would find herself today in a worse condition than she actually does. On the other hand, we who intervened must not be surprised if the sea is tempestuous. It would be absurd to expect that a nation which had just passed through so grave a crisis would recover itself in 24 hours. And when you think that after two years we have not yet got our peace, when you think of the weakness of those who govern us, you will realize that certain crises of doubt are inevitable. But the war gave that which we required of it. It gave us victory. Let us idealize labor. When, not long ago, you hissed the song of the sickle and the hammer, you certainly did not mean to disdain these two instruments of human labor. There is nothing more beautiful and noble than the sickle, which gives us our bread, and nothing finer than the hammer, which shapes metals. We must not despise manual work. We must understand that if it is overrated today, it is because mankind as a whole is suffering from a lack of material goods. It is natural, therefore, that those who produce these necessities are excessively overrated. We do not represent a reactionary element, We tell the masses not to go too far and not to expect to transform society by means of something which they do not understand. If there is to be transformation, it must come when the historical and psychological elements of our civilization have been taken into account. Let us unmask the deceivers. We do not intend to oppose the movement of the working classes, only to unmask the work of mystification which is carried on by a horde of middle-class, lower-middle-class, and pseudo-middle-class men, who think that they have become the saviors of humanity by the mere fact of being possessed of a card of membership. We are not against the proletariat, but against the Socialist Party in as far as it continues to be anti-Italian. The Socialist Party continued, after the victory, to abuse the war, to fight against those who had been in favor of intervention threatening reprisals and excommunication. Well, I, for my part, shall not give way. I laugh at excommunication. And as for reprisals, we shall answer with sacred reprisals. But we cannot go against the people, because the people made the war. We cannot look askance at the peasants, who today are agitating for the solution of the land question. They commit excesses, but I ask you to remember that the backbone of the infantry was the peasantry. Repentance. We do not deceive ourselves by thinking that we shall succeed in sinking completely the now-wrecked ship of Bolshevism. But I already note signs of repentance. I think that some day the working classes, tired of letting themselves be duped, will turn to us, recognizing that we have never flattered them, but have always told them the brutal truth, working really in their interests. If today Italy has not fallen into the Hungarian abyss, it is due to us because we have saved them by active interposition and by our life. We have then one clear duty, which is to understand the social phenomenon which is developing before our eyes and to fight the deceivers of the people and maintain a sure and immovable faith 
in the future of the nation. Towards Equilibrium There has been a period of lassitude on the morrow of all great historical crises. But afterwards, little by little, the tired muscles recover. All that which before was neglected and despised becomes once more honored and admired. Today, nobody wants to talk of war, and it is natural. But when a certain period of time has elapsed, things will change, and a large part of the Italian people will recognize the moral and material value of victory. They will honor those who fought, and will rebel against those governments which do not guarantee the future of the nation. All the people will honor the great Arditi. It was the Arditi who went to the trenches singing, and if we return from the Piave and the Isonzo, if we still hold Fiume and are still in Dalmatia, it is due to them. Three martyrs among the thousands who were consecrated to the war clearly defined what were to be the destinies of the nation. Battisti tells us that the boundary of Italy should be at the Brenner. Sorrow that the Adriatic must be an Italian sea and commercially Italo Slav while Rismondo tells us that Dalmatia is Italian. Very well. Let us swear upon the standard, which bears the sign of death, of that death which gives life, and the life which does not fear death, to keep faith to the sacrifices of these martyrs. Loud applause. End of section 12. Section 13 of Mussolini as revealed in his political speeches. 4th April, 1921. Fascismo's interests for the working classes. Speech delivered at Prato della Marficia in Ferrara, 4th April, 1921. The manifestations of enthusiasm culminating in the meeting at the Prato della Marficia solemnly confirmed the triumphant development of fascismo at Ferrara, the Red Province par excellence. On that occasion, some 50,000 contadini, who had come on foot from the remotest centers of the vast province, spent the day acclaiming the leader of the black shirts and the new faith in Italy. A noteworthy feature was that many red flags belonging to the disbanded and defeated socialist leagues were deposited before Mussolini and thereupon trampled underfoot by the crowd. People of Ferrara I say people intentionally, because that which I see before me now is a marvelous gathering of the people in both the Roman and Italian sense of the word. I see among you children who are upon the threshold of life, and not long ago I shook hands with an old Garibaldian, a survivor of that heroic Italy which was born at Nola in 1821, when two cavalry officers hoisted the flag of liberty against the Bourbons, and which triumphed at Vittorio Veneto with the great and magnificent victory of the Italian people. I see also among you factory hands and their brothers of the fields. We, fascisti, have a great love for the working classes, but our love, in as far as it is pure, is seriously disinterested and intransient. Our love does not consist in burning incense and creating new idols and new kings, but in telling upon every occasion and in every place the plain truth. And the more this truth is unpalatable, the greater the need to speak it out. We, fascisti, hitherto slandered and maligned, wished to continue the war in order to obtain freedom of movement in Italy, and although not giving way to a sense of weak demagogism, we are the first to recognize that the rights of the laboring classes are sacred, and even more so the rights of those who work the soil. And here I can give hearty praise to the fascisti of Ferrara, who have undertaken with facts, and not with the useless words of the politicians, that agrarian revolution which must gradually give the peasants the possession of the soil. I strongly encourage the fascisti of Ferrara to go on as they have begun, and to become the vanguard of the fascista agrarian movement in all Italy. How does it come about that we are said to be sold to the middle classes, capitalism, and the government? But already our enemies dare no longer continue this accusation, so false and ridiculous is it. This impressive meeting would move a heart harder than mine, 
and it shows me that you have done justice to those base calumnies put into circulation by people who believed in the eternity of their fortunes while in reality they had barricaded themselves in a castle which must fall with the first breath of the fascista revolt and this fascista revolt and we could also use the more sacred and serious word revolution is inspired by indestructible and moral motives and has nothing to do with incentives of a material nature we fascisti say that above all the competition of those differences which divide men and which might also be called natural and inevitable since life would be extraordinarily dull if everybody thought in the same way above all this there is a single reality common to all and it is the reality of the nation and of the country to which we are bound as the tree is bound by its roots to the soil which nourishes it thus whether you like it or not the country is an indestructible eternal and immortal unity which like all ideas institutions and sentiments in this world may be eclipsed for a time but which revives again in the depths of the soul as the seed thrown in the soil bursts into flower with the coming of the warmth of spring we have thus by our furious blows broken the unworthy crust beneath which lay imprisoned the soul of the proletariat there were those among the proletariat who were ashamed to be italian there were those who brutalized by propaganda shouted welcome to the germans and also long live austria they were for the most part irresponsible but sometimes wicked well we fascisti want to bring into every city into every part of the country even the most remote the pride and passion of belonging to the most noble italian race the race which has produced dante which has given galileo the greatest masterpieces of art verde massini garibaldi and denuncio to the world and which has produced the people who won vittorio veneto and not this only we do not intend to push the working classes backwards all that which they have won and which they will win is sacred but they must acquire these conquests by material and moral improvement we fascisti do not speak only of rights we speak also of duty as marzini would have wished we have not only the verb to take we also have the verb to give because sometimes when our country calls whether she be threatened by an internal or external enemy we exact both from our adherents and from those who sympathize with our readiness even for the supreme sacrifice and you fascisti of ferrara have consecrated the fascista ideals with martyrdom if the idea of fascismo had not contained in itself great potentiality nobility and beauty do you think that it would have spread with this tremendous impetus do you think that seven lies would have been given for it lies which point out to us the path of perseverance and victory a short time ago i went to your cemetery one by one we visited the graves and threw our flowers upon them those seconds of silence which we passed there were pregnant with feeling each one of us felt that within these graves were the bodies of young men in the flower of their days men who were certainly loved and who had before them all the possibilities of life they are dead they have fallen but we in this great hour of your history o people of ferrara will recall them one by one in the orders of the day and since they are not dead because their mortal clay is transformed in the infinite play of the possibilities of the universe we ask of the pure bright blood of the youth of ferrara the inspiration to be true to our ideals to be faithful to our nation and so we are content that our flags after having saluted the dead smile on life because the working people of ferrara and of all italy have found the true path that had been forgotten have cast off all those ignoble politicians who had filled their heads with lying fables we o oh italians of ferrara have no need to go beyond our boundaries beyond the seas in order to find the word of wisdom and of life we do not need to go to russia in order to see how a great people may be massacred we do not need to turn the pages of the muscovite gospels gospels which the prophets themselves are reviling since overwhelmed by the reality of life they are denying them 
we have no need to imitate others because brilliant original minds are to be found in italy in all branches of civilization and learning and if there is to be socialism it cannot be the bestial tyrannical socialism of yesterday it can only be the socialism of carlo piscane of giuseppe ferrari and giuseppe massini here o people of ferrara is your history your life and your future and we who have undertaken this hard battle which has cost us tens and hundreds of lives we do not ask you for your salaries we do not ask you for votes we only ask you for one thing and that is that you shall shout with us long live italy loud applause end of section thirteen section fourteen of mussolini as revealed in his political speeches section fourteen six december nineteen twenty two my father was a blacksmith and i have worked with him he bent iron but i have the harder task of bending souls speech delivered at milan six december nineteen twenty two before the workmen of the iron foundries in answer to engineer vanzetti the manager on the occasion of his first visit to milan after assuming the premiership of the council the city where he had lived in the centre of his victorious political strife mussolini was urgently summoned to the works of the lombard iron foundries Ascieri lombarda where he was welcomed with enthusiastic demonstrations of support and appreciation during the stormy years of nineteen nineteen twenty these very works were the scene of extraordinary events i am particularly glad to have seen these works already known to me by what has been accomplished in them in the last five strenuous years i am not going to make a speech but as has always been and always will be my way i shall tell you things clearly as they are things that will interest you the government over which i have the honour of presiding is not cannot and does not wish to be anti-proletariat the workmen are a vital part of the nation they are italians and like all italians when they work when they produce and when they live orderly lives must be protected respected and defended my government is very strong and does not need to seek a great deal of outside support and neither asks for it nor refuses it if the workmen's organizations choose to give me support i shall not reject it but we shall have to come to a clear understanding and to make definite agreements in order to avoid dissension later i was deeply moved just now while i was visiting the factory and seemed for an instant to be living again the bygone days of my youth because i did not come from an aristocratic and illustrious family my ancestors were peasants who tilled the earth and my father was a blacksmith who bent red-hot iron on the anvil sometimes when i was a boy i helped my father in his hard and humble work and now i have the infinitely harder task of bending souls at twenty i worked with my hands i repeat with my hands first as a mason's lad and afterwards as a mason and i do not tell you this in order to arouse your sympathy but to show you how impossible it is for me to be against the working class i am however the enemy of those who in the name of false and ridiculous ideologies try to dupe the workmen and drive them towards ruin you will have the opportunity of realizing that more valuable than my words will be the acts of my government which in all that it does will be inspired by and keep before it these three fundamental principles first the nation which is an undeniable reality secondly the necessity of production because greater and better production is not only the interest of the capitalist but also of the workman since the workman together with the capitalist loses his livelihood and falls into poverty if the productions of the nation do not find a market in the trade centers of the world thirdly the protection of the legitimate rights of the working classes keeping these three essential principles in sight i intend to give peace to italy and to make her more respected at home and abroad nobody wants to go in search of adventures which will imperil the lives and wealth of the citizens but on the other hand neither do we wish to follow a policy of renunciation nor allow italy to be the last considered among the nations in order that we may be listened to in international conferences 
conferences which are of the greatest importance to you workmen. It is necessary that the most rigid discipline be maintained at home, as no one will listen to us if we have a disturbed and unsettled country behind us. You, workmen, must not think that it is only the head of the government who is speaking to you now, but a man who knows you well and who is known by you, a man who understands your value and what you can and what you cannot do. But, as the head of the government, I tell you that this one over which I preside is serious, strong, and sure of itself, and no slow-moving bureaucracy. It is a government that wishes to act in the interests of the working classes, interests which will always be recognised when they are just. The workmen thought that they could, and ought to, disassociate themselves from the life of the nation, and this has been a great mistake. They ought, instead, to be a most intimate part of the nation, so that all our long and laborious toiling may not be miserably lost. This is the message which comes from our dead, who, hovering above us, repeat this command. The Italian people must somehow find that medium of harmony necessary for the reconstruction and development of civilization. And if there be rebellious and seditious minorities, they must be inexorably stamped out. Treasure up these words in your hearts and remember the motto of the fascist syndicates. The country must not be denied, but conquered. I raise my glass with you and drink to the future and the fortunes of Italian industry, that it may take a glorious place in the eyes of the whole world. End of section 14 Section 15 of Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches 6 January 1923 Labor to Take the First Place in New Italy Speech Delivered at Rome 6 January 1923 before a representative gathering of fascisti dock workers from Genoa, who had presented him with an illuminated address. You must certainly be aware of the fact that I take great interest in your city, an interest which dates from 1915, when Genoa, together with Milan and Rome, led the way to revolution, because the revolution which has brought the fascisti into power began in the May of 1915 was continued in the October of 1922, and goes on still, and will go on for some time. I am very pleased to accept your message, and I thank you with sincere cordiality. I must tell you that the government over which I have the honor of presiding never has had, never can, and never will have the intention of following a so-called anti-labor policy. On the contrary, I want to praise the working classes, who do not put obstacles in the way of the government who work and who have practically abolished strikes. They have redeemed themselves because they no longer believe in the Asiatic utopia which came from Russia. They believe in themselves, in their work. They believe in the possibility, which for me is a certainty, of a prosperous Italian nation. You have been directly interested in this greatness of the nation, and you, who come from such a live center as Genoa, are the most suited to feel this ferment of new life all this active preparation for a new destiny. The government, as you see, governs for all, over the heads of all, and if necessary, against all. It governs for all because it takes into account all general interests. It governs against all when any group, whether of the middle class or of the proletariat, tries to put its interests before the general interests of the nation. I'm sure that if the working classes, of which you are the aristocratic minority, continue to give this noble exhibition of tranquility and discipline. The nation, which was upon the verge of ruin, will recover itself completely. I do not say things which have not been well considered and thought over. And after two months of government, I tell you that if the fascista revolution had been postponed for another few months, or perhaps only another few weeks, the nation would have fallen into a state of chaos all that we are performing now is really work in arrears. We are freeing the citizens from the weight of laws, which were the result of a foolish demagogic policy. We are freeing the state from all those superstructures which were suffocating it, from all the economic functions which it was unfitted to perform. We are working to balance the budget, which means re-establishing the value of the lira, which means taking a position of dignity and influence in the international world. The Italy which we wish to make, which we are building up day by day, which we shall succeed in making, 
as it is our aim and our immovable determination to do so will be a magnificent creation of power and of wisdom you can rest assured that in this italy the workman and all labor both of the brain and of the hands will take as his right the first place End of section 15. Section 16 of Mussolini as Revealed in His Political Speeches. Part 4. Mussolini the Fascista. 23rd March, 1919. The Three Declarations at the First Fascista Meeting. Speech delivered at Milan, 23rd March, 1919, at the First Fascista Meeting. In the spring of 1919, the most critical period through which Italy has passed, the attempt initiated by Benito Mussolini to summon the men prepared to fight Bolshevism, that apparently triumphant beast, seemed absolute madness. A handful of bold spirits, for the most part ex-soldiers, coming from the extreme interventionist sections, responded to the appeal. But the gravity of the moment and the danger of physical sacrifice to which they exposed themselves were not sufficient to lessen their ardor and determination for an immediate counteroffensive. This had its conclusive expression in the assault upon and the burning of the offices of the newspaper Avanti, which took place on a day of general strike, when 200,000 workmen marched defiantly through the streets of Milan. First of all, a few words about the proceedings. Without too much formality or pedantry, I will read you three declarations which seem to me worthy of being discussed and voted upon. Then, in the afternoon, we will resume the discussion of the declaration of our program. I tell you at once that we cannot go into detail. Wishing to act, we must take salient facts as they exist. The first declaration is as follows. The meeting of the 23rd March first salutes with reverence and remembrance the sons of Italy who have fallen for the cause of the greatness of the country and the liberty of the world, the maimed and disabled, and all the fighters and ex-prisoners who fulfilled their duty, and declares itself ready to uphold strongly the vindication of rights, both material and moral, advocated by the Association of Fighters. As we do not wish to form a party of ex-soldiers, because something in that line has already been done in various cities in Italy, we cannot say exactly what this program of vindications will be. Those interested will do so. We declare simply that we will uphold them. We do not wish to classify the dead, to look into their pockets to find out to which party they belonged. We leave this sort of occupation to the official socialists. We include in one single loving thought all the fallen, from the general to the humblest soldier, from the most intelligent to the most ignorant and uncultured. But you must allow me to remember with special, if not exclusive, affection our dead, those who were with us in the glorious May, the Corradoni, the Regazzoni, Vidali, Defenu, and our Serrani, all that marvelous youth which went to fight and remained to die. Certainly when one speaks of the greatness of the country and the liberty of the world, there may be someone who will sneer and smile ironically, because it is the fashion now to run down the war. But war must be either wholly accepted or wholly rejected. If this line is to be taken up, it will be for us to do so, and not the others. Besides, wishing to examine the situation in the light of facts, we say that the active and passive sides of so immense an undertaking cannot be established with cut-and-dried figures. One cannot put on one side the quantum of that which has been accomplished and that which has not. The qualifying element must be taken into account. From this point of view, we can, with complete certainty, maintain that the country is greater today, not only because it extends as far as the Brenner, reached by Ergisto Betsy, to whom my thoughts turn, applause, not only because it extends as far as Dalmatia, Italy is greater, even if small minds try their little experiments, because we feel ourselves greater inasmuch as we have the experience of the war, inasmuch as we willed it. It was not forced upon us, and we could have avoided it. The choosing of this path 
was a sign that there are elements of greatness in our history and our blood. Because if we were not so, we, today, should be the least important people in the world. The war has given us that for which we asked. It has yielded its negative and positive advantages. Negative in as far as it has prevented the houses of Habsburg and Hohenzollern from dominating the world. And this result, which all can see, is enough in itself to justify the war. And positive, because in no nation has reaction triumphed. Everything moves towards a stronger political and economic democracy. In spite of certain details, which may injure the more or less intelligent elements, the war has given all that we asked. And why do we speak of ex-prisoners also? It is a burning question. Evidently, there were those who surrendered themselves, but those are called deserters. The large majority of the mass which fell prisoner did so after having fought and done their duty. If this were not so, we could begin to brand Cesare Battisti and many brave and brilliant officers and men who had the misfortune to fall into the hands of the enemy. The National Vindications, Second Declaration The meeting of the 23rd March declares that it will oppose imperialism in other peoples which would be prejudicial to Italy and any eventual imperialism in Italy, which would be prejudicial to other nations, and accepts the fundamental principle of the League of Nations, which presupposes the geographical integrity of every nation. This, as far as Italy is concerned, must be realized on the Alps and the Adriatic, with the annexation of Fiume and Dalmatia. We have 40 million inhabitants, and an area of 287,000 square kilometers, divided by the Apennines, which reduced still further the availability of the land capable of cultivation. In 10 or 20 years' time, we shall be 60 millions, and we have a bare million and a half square kilometers of land in the way of colonies, which to a large extent is barren, and to which we certainly can never send the surplus of our people. But if we look around, we see England, with 47 million inhabitants, and a colonial empire of 55 million square kilometers. And we see France, with a population of 38 millions, and a colonial empire of 15 million square kilometers. And I could prove to you, with figures, that all the nations of the world, not excluding Portugal, Holland, and Belgium, have colonies which they cling to, and are not in the least disposed to relinquish for all the ideologies which come from the other side of the ocean. Imperialism is at the base of the life of every people, which desires economic and spiritual expansion. That which distinguishes the different kinds of imperialism is the method adopted in its pursuit. Now the method which we choose and shall choose will never resemble the barbaric penetration of the Germans. And we say, either everybody idealist or nobody. One cannot understand how people who are well off can preach idealism to those who suffer, because that would be very easy. We want our place in the world because we have a right to it. I reaffirm the principle of the society of nations, but we must beware lest this principle mean only protection of the material interests of the wealthy nations. In view of the elections, third declaration. The meeting of the 23rd March pledges the fascisti to prevent, by every means in their power, the candidature of neutralists of any party. You see, I pass from one subject to another, but there is logic in it, an underlying thread. I am not an enthusiast for ballot paper battles, so much so that for some time I have abolished the chronicles of the chamber, and nobody is sorry. My example, too, has caused other papers to do the same within the limits of strict necessity. It is clear in any case that the elections will take place before the end of the year. The date and the system to be followed are not yet known, but this year these electoral campaigns and ballot paper battles will take place. Now, whether one likes it or not, the war having been, of late, the dominant event of our national life, it is clear that in these elections the subject of the war cannot be avoided. We shall accept the battle precisely on the topic, war, 
because not only have we not repented of that which we have done, but we go further and say, with that courage which is the result of our individuality, that if the same condition of things which existed in 1915 were repeated in Italy, we should demand war again, as in 1915. Now it is very sad to think that there are those who formerly were in favor of intervention and who now have changed. Only a few have done so, and it has not always been for political reasons. Some have changed for those reasons, and this I do not wish to discuss. But there has also been defection due to physical fear. In order to pacify these people, let us see Dalmatia, let us renounce something. But their calculations have piteously failed. We shall not only refuse to take up this political line, but we shall not give way to that physical fear which is simply absurd. One life is of the same value as another, and one barricade is as good as another. If there is to be a fight, we shall engage also in that of the elections. There have been neutralists also among the official socialists and the republicans. We shall go and examine the passports of all these people both the ultra-neutralists and those who accepted the war as a painful burden. We shall go to their meetings, we shall present candidates, and find every possible means of routing them. Prolonged applause. End of section 16. Section 17 of Mussolini as revealed in his political speeches. Section 17. 22nd July 1919. Outline of the Aims and Program of Fascismo Speech delivered at Milan, 22nd July 1919, at the Lesio Beccaria. The evening before the general international strike of the 20th and 21st of July 1919, called by the federal organisations as a reaction to the rash movement, the National Socialists, the Republicans, the Democrats and the Fascisti met in order to share their responsibilities for possible complications and to demonstrate the inconsistency of so-called revolutionary attitudes. This manifestation, according to the intention of its organisers, had also the object of marking the beginning of a political concentration of the left, composed of ex-interventionists. But the attempt afterwards failed chiefly on account of want of understanding on the part of the Republican Party and because of the development of the spiritual crisis within the mass of Italian fascismo. I think that it will depend upon the sincerity and loyalty with which we join in this meeting whether it will become an historical event or a little fact of everyday life destined to pass without leaving any trace. This being the case, it will not surprise you if I speak with a frankness almost brutal. I add at once that with friendly confusion of this moment of reunion after schisms and separations will not eliminate the necessity of settling certain personal and political questions. Otherwise this union, which we wish to be eminently fruitful, cannot be other than painfully sterile. What we are looking for, we who are members of USM, the Fascio of Fighters, the Association of Fighters, the Association of Arditi, the Union of Demobilized, the Association of Volunteers, the Association of Garibaldians, the Republican Party, the Italian Socialist Union, the Corridoni Club, etc. We who are together represented in the Committee of Intensa Iazione, which was formed at the time of the movement against the high cost of living. We are looking for the least common denominator for this understanding in action. Shall we find it? Yes. We come from different schools. We have different temperaments, and temperaments divide men more widely than ideas. We belong to an individualist people, but all this does not prevent something else bringing us together and binding us both in these present contingencies and in that which has to do with the action of tomorrow. The Basis of Unity There can be a thousand shades of ideas among us, but upon one important point we are all agreed, and that is in regarding the socialist manifestation as a bluff, a comedy, a speculation, and blackmail. Also, we are all agreed in making a differentiation between the Socialist Party and the mass of the workmen. The Socialist Party has usurped up to yesterday the name of being a pure revolutionary organisation, 
of being the protector and the exclusive, genuine representative of the working masses. This is all nonsense and must be cleared up. Referring to statistics, we find that out of 42 millions of Italians, hardly 60,000 were enrolled in the Socialist Party in the August of 1919, and the dominating element is a group composed of lower middle class people in the most philistine sense of the word. In the unlikely and absurd event of a triumph on the part of the Leninist revolutionaries, ten of these idiots would be tomorrow the ten ministers of the Italian nation. The Socialist Party is one thing, and the organised mass of working men another, and the disorganised mass yet another and seven times larger than the rest put together. We must not allow ourselves to approach the working classes in the sometimes unctuous, sometimes theatrical manner of the demagogues. The masses must be educated and for this reason must have the straight truth. Many of the crowds which the socialists sway are not worthy of blandishments, because they consist of masses of brutes infected and barbarized by the red gospel. Our working class colleagues know all about it, because they have had to leave certain factories. We must not present ourselves to the masses as charlatans, promising paradise within a short time, but as educators who do not seek either success, popularity, salaries or votes. Produce, produce, produce. The admonition of Merheim. The way in which the working masses should and must be spoken to has been shown us by Merheim, one of the thinking heads of French syndicalism. Last January he made a very important speech, and it would be a good thing to run over those parts of it which are now of most importance, especially those touching upon the relations between economics and politics, and the necessity of production. The militant socialist must tell the truth, and all the truth, to the masses, even if the truth brings hatred and slander. Now the truth is for all those who reflect that the bad conditions of life, which are the trouble of the masses, are not going to be remedied by a solution based on an increase of wages, which is not only inoperative, but entirely in opposition to economic laws. The masses must be told that the regime of production and distribution of commodities must undergo a transformation. If efficacious and lasting remedies are to be found for existing bad conditions, and that this can be arrived at by means of the force of organisation. It is pleasant to provoke loud applause by telling the audience at meetings that we are overstocked with commodities, and that they can consume without limit and enjoy comfort by imposing wages proportionate to their desires, without increasing production. Courage lies in repeating to the masses that each man is at the same time a producer and consumer, and that the continued increase of production is necessary and indispensable. Courage lies in saying that it is not only impossible to satisfy those normal needs, natural to everyone, without normal production, but that it is absolutely impossible to obtain general comfort for everyone if at the same time individual production in the general interest is not increased. Courage lies in proclaiming that the purely political revolution which inflames the people's minds would not solve the social problem, the solution of which has been precipitated and rendered essential by the war. Courage lies in repeating untiringly to the masses that the revolution which must be brought about must be economic, and that it is not to be brought about in the streets by a delirious crowd destroying for the sake of destruction. Courage lies in saying that an economic revolution draws its substance from labour, and that it is strengthened, advanced, and carried out by the intensification of production, whether in the fields or in the factories, and by further utilisation of scientific processes and methods of production. The Italian Situation We agree upon a third point, in connection with existing circumstances, that is in maintaining that our national situation is critical, though far from being desperate. Briefly, it is this. From the 1st July we have been defaulting debtors of England. Since the 31st of July, other financial agreements with the United States must be faced. To save the situation, a loan of one million dollars, seven to eight million lire, must be arranged. The railways have a coal supply for only 15 more days. There are enough provisions for another 20 days that is to say until the end of the month. 
Two million tons of food must be imported to save us from immediate hunger. But these financial and economic agreements depend upon the political ones at Paris. The possibility, almost a certainty, has prevented itself to us of attaining large concessions in Asia Minor with the coal mines of Heraclea. Clemenco has made difficulties about it, but Lansing told him that he could not see any obstacle given that Italy approved of the exploitation of the Saar mines in the part of France. We may also obtain oil wells in Armenia. But these acquisitions in the east are in their turn subordinate to the Adriatic agreements. The solution of the problem of Fiume is already compromised by the work of the preceding delegation, which had already accepted the principle of a free state. But the project of Tardieu presented future dangers as far as the safeguarding of the Italian character of Fiume is concerned, because the Italian majority in the city would be overwhelmed by the mass of Slavs in the country. It is a question, then, of reducing these dangers to the smallest possible limits by the introduction of another plan which would substitute for the idea of a free state, that of a free city with limited boundaries. In Dalmatia, it is only possible for us to save the centres which have an Italian majority, with guarantees for the safeguarding of those Italian minorities scattered in the other centres. The eventual loss of Sebenico, which had strategic and not national value, would be compensated for by some other strategic point to be given to Italy. Lansing said this would be eventually sought for in the Mediterranean. Given this situation, it is no exaggeration to say that the General Socialist strike is a real attempted crime against the nation. And note, I could understand a strike which had as its object the setting up of the Soviet in Italy, but I do not understand or admit this one, which is without aim, object or justification. It must and will fail, because the leaders themselves are in the cul-de-sac of this dilemma. Either tragedy, because the state at this moment has its repressive machinery in full working order, or comedy, in the event of a revolt on the part of the workmen already outlined, and due to their being tired of serving a socialist party mostly comprised of middle-class elements. Perhaps it is worthwhile in passing to confute the objection in the stamper of Porto Guerrero which would like to deny our right of rising up against the strike on the ground that we were in favour of war. What, it says, is the damage done in two days of strike compared with that done in four years of war? We crush these gentlemen with the reply that four years of neutrality would have damaged us more, besides having been to our lasting and ineffaceable moral shame. Reactionaries and vice versa. For me, revolution is not an attack on St. Vita's stance or an unexpected fit of epilepsy. It must have force, aims, and above all method. In 1913, when the Socialist Party was already rotten, it was I who put into circulation the words which made the pulses of the big men of Italian socialism beat. This proletariat is in need of a bath of blood, I said. It has had it, and it lasted for three years. This proletariat is in need of a day of history, and it has had a thousand. It was necessary then to shake up the masses because they had fallen into a state of weakness and insensibility. Today this situation exists no longer. Today the only way not to live in a fear of a revolution is to think that we are now in the full swing of one, that it began in the August of 1914 and that it is still going on. It is not a question, as some think, of entering into a revolution as one passes from a state of tranquility to a state of action. The task of really free spirits is different. If this great and immense process of changing the world stagnates or becomes confused, we can hasten it on. But if it is already progressing at a frantic rate, then our task is to apply the brakes and slow it down, in order to avoid disintegration and ruin. To be revolutionaries in certain circumstances, time and place can be the pride of a lifetime, but when those who speak of revolution are a lot of parasites, then one must not be afraid in opposing them to pass as a reactionary. One is always a reactionary and a revolutionary for somebody. Fritz Adler, revolutionary in the time of Sturck, is a reactionary today compared with the communists. I am not afraid of the word. I am a revolutionary and a reactionary. Really, life is always like this. I am afraid of the revolution which destroys and does not create. 
I fear going to extremes, the policy of madness, at the bottom of which may lie the destruction of this our fragile mechanical civilization, robbed of its solid moral basis, and the coming of a terrible race of dominators who would reintroduce discipline into the world and re-establish the necessary hierarchies with the cracking of whips and machine guns. The Compass At the same time, as regards reaction and revolution, I have a compass in my pocket which guides me. All that which tends towards making the Italian people great finds me favourable, and, vice versa, all that which tends towards lowering, brutalising and impoverishing them finds me opposed. Now socialism comes into the second category. I find it odd that my friend Carly, the founder of the National Association of Fighters and a valiant soldier, puts the socialists among the advanced parties, storming them with a succession of whys, as he did in the last number of the Roma Futurista. I deny the title of vanguard to socialism. I deny the use and timeliness of any cooperation with this party. I maintain that a reactionary party in 1914, 15, 16, 17 and 18 cannot become revolutionary in 19. I maintain that the serenading of the socialists is useless and this making of advances not clean. One day, in the culminating moment of the history of humanity, they embraced the cause of reaction represented by the Germany of Hohenzollerns and Sudikim. Besides, it is idiotic and dangerous to lavish blandishments upon the official socialists. We cannot reconcile ourselves with these people. There have been those who have attached themselves to the movement of today, but the socialists have disdained that help because they are megalomaniacs and nourish, among other things, the fatuous vanity of a splendid isolation. The Revision of the Treaty of Versailles The peace of Versailles is not a sufficient motive for the courted collaboration. Things must be made clear. The socialists talk of annulling the peace. We wish simply to revise it. We do not condemn wholesale a peace which a German, and not one of the most insignificant, Edward Bernstein, has called nine parts just. The revision of the peace must not mean condemnation of the war. The Florentine Republican Union has published a manifesto which defines the limits of protest against the Treaty of Versailles. We do not wish to conceal, say the Florentine Republicans, that although requiring radical amendments, the treaty is, after all, the consecration of the fall of four imperial autocracies, the fall of numerous dynasties, the creation of as many republics, the re-establishment of Poland, the reconquest of Alsace and Lorraine, and of Trento and Trieste by Italy, and of Jerusalem by civilized Europe. All this would suffice as long as emendations were made to be a witness to the supreme sanctity of the Italian intervention in the atrocious war let loose by the brutal German Hohenzollerns and Habsburgs. We do not approve, however, of the proposed general strike as a form of protest, because, and we say so with the traditional sincerity of our party, the country is thirsty for fruitful work, and this deluge of strikes certainly does not help in that. The peace of Versailles must be corrected and brought into keeping with the progress of humanity. This is also our idea. Rather than seek or beg for useless cooperation, let us outline a program of our own understanding and action. I refuse after having got rid of the old, to accept the new dogmas. I think that it is possible to create a strong economic organization in Italy based upon these principles. 1. Absolute independence from all parties, groups and sets. 2. Federation and autonomy. 3. Abolition as far as possible of all paid officials. 4. No steps to be taken without having consulted regularly, by means of a referendum, the masses interested. The means of obtaining this end may be altered according to time and place. The organisation will promote at times cooperation, and at times war between the classes and the expropriation of class. It will not always be for cooperation, but neither will it always be in favour of class preservation. And when it expropriates, it will not be to make all poor, but to make all rich. In the conquest of a colonial market and in certain questions connected with the customs, 
The middle class and the proletariat can work together. When there is division of booty, then class war. But class war in times of underproduction is destructive nonsense. In the political field. The electoral reform will pass. The scrutiny of lists and proportional representation will pass. That will determine for obvious reasons the great coalitions. The socialist Leninist, the clerical popular, and lastly, ours, which might be called the alliance for the constituent, the Republican alliance, or the group of the interveners of the left. Our program is to present candidates who pledge themselves to place the problem of constitutional revision before the new chamber in the first session. This is the constituent as I understand it. This is the lowest denominator to which all of us can pledge ourselves and around which we can all form a union. The moment is particularly propitious for such an organisation. I think that all we who are represented in this Milanese committee of Intesa e Azione can follow this path. It is a case of nationalising this attempt, of making it general all over Italy. We could, if we wish, number not thousands, but millions of followers. I myself refuse, in the actual delicate economic situation in Italy, to adhere to any movement which makes the path clear for Bolshevism and ruin. The victory cannot and must not be destroyed. I understand a certain impatience, but I beg you to reflect that if the lives of individuals are counted in years, the lives of nations are counted in centuries, and we must not refer egoistically to ourselves that which is of a general nature. Good strategy is calculation and audacity. We do not wish to govern by recourse to the bayonet alone, because that would be dictatorship, which we condemn. We wish first to sound the masses by the coming elections. Once having had our principles accepted, we will spring to action. The revolution which we desired and obtained in 1915 will be ours again by the victorious peace in its conclusive phase, and it will be called Well-Being, Liberty, and, above all, Italy. Loud applause. End of section 17. Section 18 of Mussolini as revealed in his political speeches. Fascismo and the Rights of Victory. Speech delivered at Florence, 9th, October 1919, at the First Congress of the Fascisti. At Florence was held the First Congress of the Fasci Italiani di Cabmedimento, which was the name originally given to the Fascista movement. This Congress succeeded the improvised, unorganized meeting of 19th March at Milan, and was held in an atmosphere of isolation and hostility, amid continuous tumult and interruption, so much so that the members of the Congress were repeatedly obliged to suspend their proceedings and go out of the streets to defend themselves against hostile demonstrations. At that time, Florence, the cradle of art, and famed for courtesy and hospitality, had been temporarily submerged under waves of Bolshevism. Serrati and Lenin, referring to the Italian situation, could point to the capital of Tuscany as the most fertile soil for the imminent revolutionary harvest. But even on that occasion, Italian fascismo was able to hold the center successfully, in spite of the numbers of the adversary. Fascisti comrades! I do not know if I shall succeed in giving you a very connected speech, as I have not had the opportunity of preparing it, as is my habit. I had intended to make a fascista speech tomorrow morning for a personal reason which might also interest you, and which gave me the right to ask some hours of rest. The other day I left Navi Lagor in the SVA with a magnificent pilot, and having crossed the Adriatic, came down at Fiume, where D'Annunzio gave us a great welcome. Returning yesterday, we were caught in a storm on the Australian tablelands, and were obliged to get out of our course and to come down at Aiello. At Fiume, I lived in what D'Annunzio justly calls an atmosphere of miracles and prodigies. In the meantime, I bring you his message. He was thinking of writing one especially for our meeting. My arrival at Fiume coincided with the capture of the ship Persia, about which Captain Giulietti of the Federation of the Sea was so agitated. The situation at Fiume is splendid from every point of view. There are supplies for three months. The Yugoslavs have no intention of moving. Not only that, the Croats, to a certain extent, are supplying the town. 
which shows how inappropriate and insidious the movement was which tried to stir up the people and make them believe that we were on the verge of a war against the Yugoslavs. Nothing of this exists. D'Annunzio has not, so far, fired a single shot against those who are on the other side of the line of the armistice. On the contrary, he has issued a proclamation to the Croats, which is a magnificent document both from the political and the human point of view. It ends with these words, Long live the Italian-Croat Brotherhood! Long live the Brotherhood on the Sea! Now, as regards international relations, the position of Fiume is perfectly clear. D'Annunzio will not move, because everything is in his favor. What can the plutocrat powers of Western capitalism do against him? Nothing! Absolutely nothing! Because to strive against a fait accompli would be to let loose a still greater calamity which nobody thinks of either in France or England. In France, and we can say so with tranquility, there is a sacred horror of further bloodshed. And as for the English, they have made war very well and brilliantly, but now all their ideas are contrary to any warlike undertakings and any adventures of even a slightly complicated nature. Tomorrow, Fiume would be a fait accompli for everybody, because nobody would have the strength to modify it. If the government had been less cowardly, the problem of Fiume would be settled by now, and the Allies would have had to accept it. The Forces of the Socialist Party And now we come to our affairs. We must keep the Socialist Party within sight. Let us look a little closer at their forces. They have had lately to number their forces, and 14,000 of its 80,000 members have disappeared. They are the disbanded. As many as 500 sections were not represented in what they call the Assizes of the Italian Proletariat. Nothing of very great importance was said or done during the Congress. Bordigia is not a great general. He is only a little above mediocrity. What he said to the Tribune was that what I told the crowd in 1913... Only Tarati's speech was of any real significance. All the other unlimited speeches did not, in the end, give practical indications of that which the socialists wish or ought to do. Our statements are much more definite than theirs, and we tell you at once that we must present an ultimatum to the government, saying that, if the censor is not abolished, we fascisti will not take part in the elections. It is necessary to protest against an enforced censorship during the period of the elections, otherwise we shall seem to show that we are ready to accept an arbitrary act. To this we can add another positive and effective protest. As for the socialists, the larger part of them are distinguished by physical cowardice. They do not like fighting. They do not wish to fight. Fire and steel frighten them. On the other hand, and I want to draw your attention to this, we must not confuse this creation, which is for the most part artificial, with a party of which the proletariat is a lowest minority. While those members abound who want a seat in Parliament, or in the communal councils, and in the organizations, it is really a political clique which wishes to substitute itself for the ruling clique. We must not confuse this group of mediocre politicians with the immense movement of the proletariat, which has a reason for its existence, development, and brotherhood. Against every idol. I repeat here what I said before. No demagogism. Work-worn hands are not yet enough to show that a man is capable of upholding a state or a family. We must react against these cajolers and these semi-idols in order to uplift these people from the moral and mental slavery into which they have fallen. We must not approach them in the attitude of partisans. We are syndicalists because we think that by means of the mass it may be possible to determine an economic readjustment. But this readjustment involves long and complicated consideration. A political revolution is accomplished in 24 hours, but the economic constitution of a nation, which forms part of the world system, is not overturned in 24 hours. But we do not by this mean to be considered as a kind of bodyguard of the bourgeoisie, which, especially where it is composed of the new rich, is simply unworthy and cowardly. 
If these people do not know how to defend themselves, they must not hope for protection from us. We defend the nation and the people as a whole. We desire the moral and material welfare of the people. I think that, with this as our attitude, it will be possible to approach the masses. In the meantime, the Federation of Seamen has separated itself from the General Federation of Labor. The railway men have proved in the big strike that they are Italian and wish to be Italian. And while the upper bureaucracy of the public administration is, on the whole, in favor of Nitti and Giolitti, the proletariat of the same administration tends to sympathize with us. For 50 years, generals, diplomats, and bureaucrats have been taken from the upper classes and from a certain limited number of persons of rank and position. It is time to put an end to all this if we want to infuse new energy and new blood into the body of the nation. For the elections. And now we come to the elections. We must deal with them because whatever happens, it is always a good thing to keep together and not to burn one's boats. It may happen that in this month of October, events may be hurried on at such a rate that the elections may be sidetracked. It may be, on the other hand, that they will take place. We must be ready also for the second contingency. And then we fascisti must do our utmost by ourselves. We must come out clearly marked and numbered. And if we are few, we must remember that we have only been in the world six months. Where there is no probability of isolated success, a union with the interveners of the left might possibly be formed, which must vindicate, on the one hand, the utility of the Italian intervention in the name of humanity and the nation against all those who opposed it, whether followers of Giolitti, socialists, or clericals. On the other hand, this program cannot exhaust our action, and we shall then have to present to the masses the fundamental principles upon which we wish to build a new Italy. Where the situation may prove more complicated, we might also be able to identify ourselves with a group of interveners in a wider and fuller sense of the word. After Vittorio Venito. But we wish, above all, to reaffirm solemnly at this meeting of ours the great Italian victory vindicating it before all those who wish to deny and forget it. We have subdued an empire which was our enemy, which had advanced to the Piave, and whose leaders had endeavored to overthrow Italy. We now possess the Brenner, the Julian Alps, and Fiume, and all the Italians of Dalmatia. We can say that between the Piave and the Asanzo, we have destroyed that empire and determined the fall of four autocracies. End of section 18. Section 19. Mussolini as revealed in his political speeches. Section 19. The Tasks of Fascismo. Speech delivered at the Pedaliti Arma, Rosetti at Trieste, 20th September 1920. The following speech may be considered as the first of the series of those which belong to the period of elaboration of the fascist programme. The moment chosen was not the most favourable, because it coincided with two manifestations equally critical both with regard to internal and to foreign policy. We refer to the occupation of the factories, then, at an acute and threatening stage, and to the legionary occupation of Fiume, the first anniversary of which was celebrated at this time. Benito Mussolini, although taking into due account these two important events, destined not to be ignored by history, could and did rise above the circumstances of the moment. As a fast-seeing statesman looking forward to resistance and final victory, he drew the attention of his hearers to a sane conception of the problems of foreign policy, not included in the enterprise of Ranchi, and at the same time heartening all Italians who were panic-stricken under the arrogant tyranny of social Bolshevism. I do not consider you, men of Trieste, as Italians to whom the whole truth cannot yet be spoken, because I think of you as among the best in the country, and your enthusiasm today has confirmed me in my opinion. The event, which had its counterpart in Rome on the 20th of September 1870, was a magnificent picture in a poor frame, but upon this I am not going to dwell. A Comforting Balance 
After a lapse of 50 years since the breach of Porta Pia, we must undertake the examination of our consciences. A nation like ours, which had issued from many centuries of disunion, which had barely achieved unity, had not then muscles strong enough to bear the weight of a world policy. A great Italian thinker, Francesco Crispi, broke this tradition. In 50 years, Italy has made marvellous progress. In the first place, she has a sure foundation, and that is the vitality of our race. There are nations which every year scan the birth rates with a certain preoccupation because, gentlemen, it is just the want of balance in this sphere which produces the great crises. You know to what I allude. But Italy is not thus preoccupied. Italy had 27 million inhabitants in 1870. She now has 50 million, 40 million of whom live in the peninsula and represent the most homogenous block in Europe. Because, compared with Bohemia, for instance, where five millions of the Czech race govern seven millions of other races, Italy has only 180,000 German subjects on the upper Adige and 360,000 Slavs, all the rest forming one compact whole. And besides these 40 millions, there are 10 millions who have emigrated to all the continents and beyond all the oceans. There are 700,000 Italians in New York alone, another 400,000 in the state of San Paolo, 900,000 in the Argentine, and 120,000 in Tunis. National Discipline It is a pity that foreigners know us so little, but it is still more serious that Italians know Italy so little. If they knew her a little better, they would realise that there are peoples beyond her boundaries who are more retrograde than she is. They would learn, for instance, that Italy possesses the most powerful hydroelectric plant in the world. Do not speak to me of reactionary forces in Italy. Those who talk to me of a reactionary government make me laugh, especially if they are immigrants or renegades from Trieste. Because if there is a country in the world where liberty is in danger of degenerating into license, and where it is the inviolable patrimony of every citizen, it is Italy. There has not yet been seen in our country that which has been seen in France, where, as the result of a political strike, the Republic dissolved the General Confederation of Labour, locked up the leaders, and keeps them still in prison. Nor have we seen that which has been witnessed in England, where so-called undesirable elements are sent over to the other side of the Channel, or in the ultra-democratic Republic of the United States, where in one single night 500 rebels were seized and sent over the Atlantic. If there is something to say, it is this. It is time to impose an iron discipline upon the individual and upon the masses, because social renovation is one thing, this we are not against, but the destruction of the country quite another. As long as transformation is spoken of, we are all agreed that when instead it is a question of a leap in the dark, then we put our veto upon it. You will pass, we say, but it will be over our bodies. You will have to overcome our resistance first. The Greatness of Victory now, after this half-century of the life of Italy, which I have thus roughly sketched, Trieste is Italian and the tricolour waves over the Brenner. If it were possible to pause one moment to measure the greatness of the event, you would find that the fact of the tricolour on the Brenner is of capital importance in the history not only of Italy, but also of Europe. The tricolour on the Brenner means that the Germans do no longer descend with impunity upon our lands. Glaciers have now been placed between us and them, and on these glaciers are the magnificent Alpine soldiers who went to the assault of Montenero, who were sacrificed at Ortigara, and who have on their flag the motto, No Passage This Way. Loud applause. Now it is a most important fact that Trieste has come to Italy after a great victory. If we were not so occupied with the daily material necessities of life and the solution of commonplace and banal problems, we should know how to appreciate all that which took place on the banks of the Piave and at Vittorio Veneto. An empire was destroyed in an hour, 
an empire which had outlasted a century, an empire in which necessity had developed a superfine art of government which consisted in the eternal divide et impra, according to the wisdom of Budapest and Vienna. This empire had an army, a traditional policy, a bureaucracy, and bound all its citizens together in a universal suffrage. This empire, which seemed so powerful and invincible, fell before the bayonets of the Italian people. The Italian risorgimento is only a struggle between a people and a state, between the Italian people on one side and the Habsburg state on the other, between the life forces of the future and the dead past. It was inevitable that having passed the Mincio in 1859 and the Upper Adige in 1866, we had in 1915 to pass the Isonzo and get beyond. It was so far inevitable that the neutrists themselves have had to acknowledge that Italy could not, under pain of death and what is worse dishonour, have remained neutral. This vindication of our intervention is the fact which gives us the greatest satisfaction. And what does it matter if I read in a gloomy and pessimistic book that the acquisition of Trento, Trieste and Fiume still represents a deficit in the balance of the war? This way of arguing is ridiculous. In the first place, historical events cannot be regulated like a page of bookkeeping with receipts and payments, debit and credit. It is impossible to make out an estimate of historical facts and expect it to agree with the final balance. All this is the result of a melancholy philosophy which was widespread over Italy after the war. But let us hope it will soon pass to leave room for a little optimism and pride. This after-war period is certainly critical. I fully recognise the fact. But who can expect that a gigantic crisis like that of five years of a world war will be settled at once? That the world will return to its previous tranquil state in less than two years? The crisis is not limited to Trieste, Milan or Italy. It is worldwide and is not yet over. The Necessity of Struggle Struggle is at the bottom of everything because life is full of contrasts. There is love and hate, black and white, night and day, good and evil. And until these contrasts are balanced, struggle will always be at the root of human nature as the supreme fatality. And it is a good thing that it is so. Today there may be war, economic rivalry and conflicting ideas, but the day in which all struggle will cease will be a day of melancholy will mean the end of all things, will mean ruin. Now this day will not come because history presents itself as a changing panorama. An attempt to return to peace and tranquillity would mean fighting against the existing dynamic period. It is necessary to prepare ourselves for other surprises and struggles. There will not be a period of peace, they say, unless the nations indulge in a dream of universal brotherhood and stretch out their hands beyond the mountains and the oceans. I, for my part, do not put too much faith in these ideals, but I do not exclude them because I never exclude anything. Everything is possible, even the impossible and absurd. But today being today... It would be fallacious, criminal and dangerous to build our houses on the quicksands of international Christian socialist communism. These ideas are very respectable, but a long way from the truth. Applause. The Patriotism of Fascismo What is the position of Fascismo in this difficult post-war period? The foundation stone of Fascismo is patriotism. That is to say, we are proud of being Italian. Now, it is just this which separates us from a great many other people, who are so ridiculous and small and hide their patriotism because 80% of the Italian population was once illiterate. This does not mean anything, for narrow, poor, elementary education may be worse than pure and simple illiteracy. It is an outworn idea that one who knows how to write must needs be more intelligent than one who does not know how to. Now we vindicate the honour of being Italian, because in our wonderful peninsula, wonderful though there are inhabitants are not always wonderful, there has been enacted the most marvellous story of humanity. Do you think that a man who lives in far Japan or in America or in any other far-off spot can be counted educated if he does not know the history of Rome? 
it is not possible. Rome. Rome is the name which filled history for twenty centuries. Rome gave the lead to universal civilization, traced the roads and assigned the boundaries. Rome gave the world the laws of its immutable rights. But if this was the universal task of Rome in ancient times, we have now another universal task. Our destiny cannot become universal unless it is transplanted to the pagan ground of Rome. By means of paganism, Rome found her form and found the means of upholding herself in the world. Note that the task of Rome is not yet completed. No. Because the story of Italy of the Middle Ages, the most brilliant story of Venice which lasted for ten centuries, with her ships in all seas and her ambassadors and her government, the like of which is no longer to be found today, is not closed. The story of the Italian communes is full of wonders, grandeur, and nobility. Go to Venice, Pisa, Amalfi, Genoa, and Florence, and you will find in the palaces and in the streets the signs and vestiges of this marvellous and not yet decayed civilization. Now, my friends, after this period, in the beginning of 1800, when Italy was divided into seven little states, there arose a generation of poets. Poetry also has its task to perform in history, in arousing enthusiasm and in kindling faith. And not for nothing, the greatest modern Italian poet, with the second-rate writers who do not know how to express the smallest idea, recognise it or not, Gabriella D'Annunzio represents, in a magnificent union of thought and sentiment, the power of action which is characteristic of the Italian people. The Dolomites of Italian Thought We are proud of being Italians, and not only for reasons of exclusivism. The modern spirit reaches out towards beauty and truth. One cannot think of a modern man who has not read Cervantes, Shakespeare, Goethe, and Tolstoy. But all this must not make us forget that we were great when the others were not yet born. And while German Klopstock was writing his verbose messiade, Dante Alighieri had been a giant for centuries. And we have also the sculpture of Michelangelo, the painting of Raffaello, the astronomy of Galileo, and the medicine of Morgagni, and with these the mysterious Leonardo da Vinci, who excelled in all fields. And then, if you want to pass to politics and war, there is Napoleon, and above all Garibaldi, most Italian of all. These are the Dolomites of Italian thought and spirit. But besides these almost inaccessible peaks, are lower summits in great numbers, which show that it is quite impossible to think of human civilization without the gigantic contribution made by Italian thought. And this must be repeated at our boundaries, where there are tribes chattering incomprehensible languages who would pretend, simply on account of their numbers, to supplant our marvellous civilization which has endured two millenniums and is ready for a third. The Sincerity of Fascismo the second foundation stone of fascismo is represented by anti-demagogism and pragmatism. We have no preconceived notions, no fixed ideas, and above all, no stupid pride. Those who say, you are unhappy, here is the receipt for happiness, make me think of the advertisement, do you want health? We do not promise men happiness, either here or in the next world, differing thus from the socialists who pretend that they can set the Russian mask on the face of the Mediterranean. Once there were courtiers who burned incense before the king and the popes. Now there is a new breed, which burns incense without sincerity, before the proletariat. Only those who hold Italy in their hands have the right to govern her, they say, while these do not know even how to control their own families. We are different. We use another language, more serious, unprejudiced, and worthy of free men. We do not exclude the possibility that the proletariat may be capable of using its present forces to other ends, but we say that before it tries to govern the nation, it must learn to govern itself, must make itself worthy, technically and still more morally, because government is a tremendously difficult and complicated task. The nation is composed of millions and millions of individuals 
whose interests clash, and there are no superior beings who can reconcile all these differences and make a union of life and progress. Fascismo is not conservative. But we are not, on the other hand, traditionalists, bound hand and foot to the stones and debris. Everything must be changed in the modern city. The ancient streets will no longer stand the wear and tear of the trams and motor traffic, because through them passes the whole of civilization. It is possible to destroy in order to create anew in a form more beautiful and great, for destruction must never be carried out in the method of a savage who breaks open a machine in order to see what is inside. We do not refuse to make changes in our spiritual life just because the spirit is a delicate matter. No social transformation which is necessary is repugnant to me. In this way, I accept the famous control of the factories and also their cooperative management by companies. I only ask that there shall be a clear conscience and technical capacity and there shall be increased production. If this is guaranteed by the workmen's unions instead of by the employers, I have no hesitation in saying that the former have the right to substitute the latter. The Bolshevist Mask that which we fascisti are opposing is this Bolshevist element in Italian socialism. It is strange that a race which has produced Pisacane and Mazzini should go in search of Gospels first to Germany and then to Russia. Pisacane and Mazzini ought to be studied, and then it would be seen that some of the truths which it is pretended have been revealed in Russia are only truths already consecrated in the books of our great Italian thinkers. How can communism be thought possible in the most individualistic country in the world? It is only possible where every man is a number, not in Italy, where every man is an individual and more has individuality. But after all, my dear friends, does Bolshevism exist in Russia? It is not any longer. There are no longer councils of the factories, but dictators of the factories. No longer eight hours of work, but twelve. No longer equal salaries, but 35 different categories, not according to need, but according to merit. There is not in Russia even that liberty which there is in Italy. Is there a dictatorship of the proletariat? No. Is there a dictatorship of the socialists? No. There is a dictatorship of a few intelligent men, not workmen, who belong to a section of the Socialist Party, and their dictatorship is opposed by all the other sections. This dictatorship of a few men is what is called Bolshevism. Now, we do not want this in Italy. The socialists themselves, realising what they have seen in Russia, recognise when you question them that that which has gone badly in Russia cannot be transplanted into Italy. Only they are wrong in not saying so openly. They are wrong in playing with equivocations and deceiving the masses. We repeat... We are not against the working classes because they are necessary to the nation, sacredly necessary. The 20 million Italians who work with their hands have the right to defend their interests. What we oppose is the deceitful action of politicians to the detriment of the working classes. We fight these due priests who promise in bad faith a paradise they do not believe in themselves. Those who are the most ardent advocates of Bolshevism here in Trieste take up this attitude in order to make themselves popular with the Slav masses who live near. And if I have a profound lack of esteem for the Bolshevist leaders in Italy and despise many of them, it is because I know them all well and have been in contact with them. I know perfectly well that when they play the lion they are rabbits, and they are like certain monks in Heinrich Heine who openly preach the drinking of water and drink wine themselves in secret. We wish to see this shameful speculation finish because it is against the interests of the nation. Always against Italy. Can you tell me by what curious chance the socialists are always against Italy in all questions? Can you tell me why they always side with those who are against Italy? with the Albanians, the Croats, the Germans, and others? Can you tell me why they shout, Long live Albania, who is fighting for Valona, which is Albanian, and do not shout, Long live Italy, 
who is fighting for Trento and Trieste, which are Italian? By what criterion are they always against Italy, shouting, down, down? Four Arabs revolt in Libya, and they shout, down with Libya. 6,000 Albanians attack Valona, and it is down with Valona. And if tomorrow the Croats of Dalmatia attack us, it will be down with Dalmatia. And if, upon the burning mountain of the Khalsa, an insurrectional movement develops against Trieste, I am afraid the Italian socialists would cry down with Trieste. But there are Italians here and elsewhere who would strangle a fratricidal cry in their throats. It was the same with their opposition to the war. War is a horrible thing in itself. Those who have been through it know, but it is necessary to explain. If they say war in itself and for itself, whatever reason, in whatever latitude, under whatever pretext must not be made, then I respect these humanitarians and Tolstoyans. If they say, I abhor that blood should be spilled under any pretext, then I respect them and admire them, although I find this impracticable. But when they cry, down with the war, when Italy makes it, and long live the war when Russia makes it, it is a different matter. They had a paper which was very happy when the so-called Bolshevists were marching towards Warsaw and employed the military style, while we are writing the cannons, etc. We know it all by heart. Is not this war, then, the same thing? Does not the Russian war make widows and orphans? Is it not made with guns, aeroplanes, and all the innumerable instruments which tear and kill human bodies? Either they must be contrary to all wars, in which case we can discuss together, or if they make distinctions between war and war, between the war which can be made and the war which cannot, well, we can tell them that their humanitarianism is simply horrible. And if they have reason to make war, we had reason to make it for the destinies of the country in 1915. Applause. The Epic of D'Annunzio What, then, is to be the task of fascismo? It is this, to bridle demagogism with courage, energy and impetuosity. Fascismo is called the fascio of fighters, and the word fighters does not leave any doubts about its aims, which are to fight with peaceful arms, but also with the arms of warriors. And this is normal in Italy, because all the world is arming itself. And so it is absolutely necessary that we Italians arm ourselves in our turn. But the task of fascismo here is more delicate, more difficult, and more necessary. Fascismo here has a reason for existence, and finds a natural field for development. I have unlimited faith in the future of the Italian nation. Crises will succeed crises. There will be pauses and parentheses, but we shall arrive at a settlement, and the history of tomorrow cannot be thought of without the participation of Italy. There have been many orders of the day, many articles in the papers, much more or less senseless talk. But the only man who has achieved a real revolutionary stroke, the only man who, for twelve or thirteen months, has held in check all the forces ranged against him, is Gabriele D'Annunzio with his legionaries. Against this man of pure Italian blood are leagued all the cowards, and it is for this reason that we are proud to be with him, even if all this tribe turn against us too. This man also represents the possibility of victory and resurrection. And this possibility exists because we have made war and won. It is ridiculous that those who most profited by it in wages, votes and honours are those who, today, turn round and revile it. In any case, I think, as indeed this meeting of yours bears witness, that the hour of the vindication of our national efficiency has struck. While, on the one hand, there is a vast world of wretched poor creatures. There is also a world which does not forget and does not ignore our victory. Applause. The Rebirth of Ideals Just as I was leaving Milan, I received from the mayor of Cupra Maritima, a little town of central Italy, an invitation to be present at their commemoration of the fallen. I did not accept because I do not like making speeches. But this episode, like the pilgrimage of the Ortigara, pilgrimage to the Grappa, 
The pilgrimage of the 24th October to the rocky Calso tells you that all ideals are not lost, but are, on the contrary, being reborn. We wish to assist this spiritual rebirth in every way possible. Yesterday I experienced a moment of great emotion when passing over the Isonzo. Every time that I have passed that river with my pack on my back, I have stooped to drink of its crystal waters. If we had not reached the other side of that river, the Tricolor would not today be flying from San Giusto. This is the real and true meaning of the war. If the Tricolor flies from San Giusto, it is because twenty years ago a man of Trieste was the forerunner. It is there because in 1915 Italian soldiers threw themselves upon the Austrian defences, and all Italy took part in that act, and the Alpine detachments of the mountains of Piedmont, Lombardy and Cruli, to the magnificent infantry of the Ruzzi, Pugli and Sicily, and the soldiers of the generous island of Sardinia, too much neglected by the government. And these generous sons have not yet risen up to take reprisals against the demagogues of Italy, because they are always ready to fulfil their duty. Men of Trieste, the tricolour of San Giusto is sacred, the tricolour on the Nivoso is sacred, and still more so is that on the Dinaric Alps. The tricolour will be protected by our dead heroes, but let us swear together that it will be defended also by the living. Prolonged applause. End of section 19. Section 20 of Mussolini as revealed in his political speeches. Fascismo and the problems of foreign policy. Speech delivered at the Politiama Rosetti Trieste, 6th of February 1921. Just as a few months before, at the time of Italy's darkest hour, when the Bolshevist movement was at its zenith, Mussolini had addressed to the people of Trieste wise words of faith. So, in the spring of 1921, the spring famous for anti-socialist reaction, Trieste was once more the city he chose as the place best suited for the exposition of his analysis of the problems of foreign policy. On that occasion, the patriotic and liberated town, which gave the first impulse of assault in the energetic offensive against the local Austrian Bolshevists, accorded to the leader of the New Italy hearty manifestations of general assent. In order to indicate the direction which Italian foreign policy should take in the immediate future, it is a good thing to give a glance first at the general situation of the world, and at the forces and currents which are at work, with a view to finding out what may be the possible developments and results. All the states of the world are in a condition of fatal interdependence. The period for splendid isolation is past for everyone. It can well be said that with the war the story of mankind has acquired a world movement. While Europe, severely weakened, struggles to recover her economic, political and spiritual balance, already beyond the boundaries of the old continent a formidable clash of interests is shaping itself. I allude to the conflict between the United States and Japan, and to the accounts of recent episodes from the affair of the cable to the bill against the yellow migration in California, which have occupied the papers. Japan has a population of 77 millions, and the United States 110 millions. That it was known that a struggle between these two states was inevitable is proved by the very significant fact that the book which had the widest circulation among all classes in Tokyo was called Our Next War with the United States, a book which outlined the war between the continents for the domination of the Pacific. The centre of world civilization is tending to alter its position. Up to about 1500, it was in the Mediterranean. After the discovery of America, it shifted to the Atlantic. Today, its passage to the biggest ocean of the planet is indicated. I said, last time I spoke here, that we were approaching the Asiatic century. Japan is destined to be the fermenting element of all the yellow world. As a result of shifting the centre of civilization from London to New York, which has already 7 million inhabitants and will soon be the biggest agglomeration of human beings on the earth, and from the Atlantic to the Pacific, there are those who foresee a gradually economic and spiritual decay of our old Europe, 
and our wonderful little continent, which has been hitherto the guiding light of all the world. Shall we live to see the eclipse of the European role in the history of mankind? The European Situation To this disquieting and depressing question we answer, it is possible. The life of Europe, especially that of Central Europe, is at the mercy of the Americans. Europe presents a troubled political and economic panorama, a thorny maze of national and social questions. And it happens that communism is sometimes the mask of nationalism and vice versa. European unity does not seem to be any nearer realisation. Egoism and the interests of nations and classes exist in proud contrast. Russia is no longer an enigma from the economic point of view. In Russia there is neither communism nor socialism, but an agrarian revolution of the democratic lower middle class kind. She only remains an enigma from the political point of view. What foreign policy does Russia follow? Is it a policy of peace or war? The variety of facts which reach our ears make us continually waver between one opinion and another. Perhaps under the emblem of the sickle and the hammer is hidden, or not hidden, the old Panslavism, which today is dominated, besides, by the immediate necessity of extending the revolution to the rest of Europe in order to save the government of the Soviet in Russia. If Russia adopts a policy of war, the fate of the Baltic states, Lithuania, Lithuania and Estonia, will be sealed. The fate of Poland would also be uncertain, and she might find herself driven against the unfriendly German wall by an eventual breaking loose of the Russian forces. There are serious conflicting interests between the different states of those northeastern shores. There is a disagreement between Poland, Lithuania and Russia as regards Vilna and Grodno. The rights on the basis of history and statistics are with Poland. There are 263,000 Poles in the district of Vilna, as compared with 118,000 Lithuanians, 8,000 white Ruthenians and 83,000 Jews. The same figures, proportionately, are found in Grodno. As for Upper Silesia, which keeps the Polish-German worlds in a state of continuous agitation, the German statistics give these returns. 1,348,000 Poles, 588,000 Germans. Upper Silesia is therefore Polish, but its final destiny will be decided by the plebiscite summoned for the 15th of March. The Treaties of Peace the Great War has resulted in six treaties of peace up to the present. Versailles, Saint-Germain, Trianon, Noy, Serre, Rapallo. Not one of these treaties has wholly satisfied the victors. Not one, even the Treaty of Rapallo, which was supposed to be a masterpiece of friendly and peaceful negotiation, has been accepted by the vanquished. As far as the Treaty of Versailles, the greatest of all, is concerned, even at this moment, the important question of the indemnity which Germany ought to pay is still under discussion. It is a figure which makes us feel giddy, and the last word has not yet been said. All the settlements, especially those made by diplomats, have an ironically provisional character. The Germans, who had formed the Sacred Union of Non-Payment, announced that they will make counter-proposals by the same representatives who will speak at London in a few weeks' time. Our opinion is that if the Germans can pay, they ought, as far as it is possible, and the experts must ascertain the truth of this possibility. We must not forget, before allowing ourselves to pity the Germans, who had already fixed our indemnity at 500 milliards of gold, in the case of their victory, that it was the Germans who began the war, and that the first irredentism was directed against Italy on account of those minorities which had descended without right into the upper arch. German Austria, Macedonia and Smyrna The present Austrian Republic was the result of the Treaty of Saint-Germain. Can it continue to live formed as it is at present? It is generally thought not. 
There remains the alternative of a Danube confederation with its centre at Vienna and Budapest, but the little Entente sees to it that there should be no return under any form of the old regime. We think that, by the force of events, an economic Danube confederation will be formed sooner or later, in which case the conditions of Austria, and especially Vienna, would improve until she had arrived at the point of lessening the pro-German annexationist movement. From the standpoint of justice, and whenever there was a clear manifestation of the will of the people, Austria would have the right of separating herself from Germany. This possible eventuality cannot leave us indifferent, because of the boundaries of the Brenner, which is a question of life or death for the Paduan Valley. A hungry and pauper Austria cannot organise a dangerous irredentism against us, but as a result of union with Germany, the question of the upper Darge would certainly become more acute. As for Hungary, she can certainly expect a revision of the treaty which mutilates her on every side. It must be added, however, that the chapter of Fiume is definitely closed in Hungarian history. Centres of infection for another war exist all over the Balkan world. Let us quote Montenegro and Albania, for example. We are in favour of the independence of both these states, provided that they show themselves capable of enjoying it. Bulgaria has a right to Macedonia, and also to a port on the Aegean. Macedonia has a population of 1,181,000 Bulgarians, 499,000 Turks, and 228,000 Greeks. And this is of capital importance for the economic expansion of Italy and Bulgaria. The Treaty of Sèvres crushed Turkey in order to exalt the Greece of Venizelos and Constantine, which gave the European war the sacrifice of 787 Uzoni. We consider, as far as the eastern Mediterranean is concerned, that Italy on the whole should follow a pro-Turkish policy. The Treaty of Rapallo Immediately after the signing of the Treaty of Rapallo, the Central Committee of the Fascio passed its judgment upon it, finding it acceptable for the eastern boundaries, inacceptable and deficient as regards Fiume, and insufficient and to be rejected as regards Zara and Dalmatia. At three months' distance, this judgment does not seem to be contradicted by successive events. The Treaty of Rapallo is an unhappy compromise against which pages of criticism were printed in the Popolo d'Italia, which it is now useless to repeat. It must be explained why victorious Italy ever arrived at the point of signing the Peace of Rapallo. And the explanations do not need much mental exertion. Rapallo was the logical consequence of the line of foreign policy followed by us or imposed upon us before, during and after the war. It is explained by Wilson and his so-called experts, and the absolute lack of Italian propaganda abroad and the dead tiredness of the people. Rapallo is explained by the meeting of the oppressed nationalities held at Rome in April 1918, which meeting can be directly connected with the ill-fated story of Caporetto. Everything is paid for in this life. On 12th November 1920, we paid Rapallo for the breakdown of 24th October 1917. Had there been no Caporetto, there would have been no Pact of Rome. In that Congress, the Yugoslavs threw dust in our eyes because in reality they did nothing towards breaking up the dual monarchy from within, of which they were the faithful slaves to the last, with traditional Croat loyalty. Not for nothing did the Habsburg monarchy upon its decease tried to present the Yugoslavs with his navy. But it was in the April of 1918 that the irreparable was committed, with the consent of all clients of Italian public opinion, including ours and the nationalists. That is to say, our worst enemies were raised to the rank of effectual and powerful allies, and naturally, when the victory was obtained, there was no accepting of the role of vanquished but they adopted that of cooperators, with a relative share in the common booty. After the Pact of Rome, it was no longer possible to place our knee on the chest of Yugoslavia. This is the truth. And so it happened that the Italian people, tired, impoverished and unnerved by two long years of useless negotiations, 
demoralised by the policy of the government and the tremendous wave of after-war sabotage against which only the fascisti reacted powerfully, accepted, or rather suffered, the Treaty of Rapallo without manifestations of grief or joy. And in order to finish it once and for all, many people would also have accepted the terrible line of Monte Maggiore. All the parties of all the grades of left and right accepted the treaty as a lesser evil. We too submitted to it, considering it merely as a transitory and ephemeral act. Has there ever been anything definite in the world much less upon the moving sands of diplomacy? And with the intention of gathering our forces to be ready for the revision which, sooner or later, would improve the treaty and not make it worse, would carry our boundaries to the Dinaric Alps but never again allow the boundaries of Yugoslavia to reach the Azonzo. The fate meted out to Dalmatia makes us very sad, but the fault does not lie wholly with the negotiators of the eleventh hour. The renunciation had already been made in Parliament, in the papers, and in the universities themselves, where a professor printed a book, which was naturally translated at Zagabria, in which he proved in his own way the Dalmatia is not Italian. The Dalmatian tragedy lies in this ignorance, bad faith, and want of understanding, faults which we hope to repair with our work by making Dalmatia known, loved, and defended. The treaty once signed could be annulled in one of two ways, by outside war or internal revolution, both equally absurd. You do not make the people throng the squares in order to change a peace treaty after five years of bloodshed. Nobody is capable of working such prodigies. It was possible to cause a revolution in Italy in order to obtain intervention. But to cause a revolution in November 1920 in order to annul a peace treaty which, good or bad, had been accepted by 99% of the Italian people, could not be considered. I do not mind much about coherence, but there are stenographic records which bear witness to the fact that I steadily refuse to go against the treaty, either by promoting outside war or internal revolution. I considered that it was also dangerous to get mixed up in an armed resistance to the treaty. The Tragedy of Fiume Two months of polemics and daily articles during November and December bear witness to my support of the cause of Fiume and my open and strong opposition to the Parliament. It is a pity that oblivion falls so quickly on the words of a daily paper, and I have not the melancholy habit of unearthing what I publish. But the undeniable truth is this, that day after day I fought so that the government at Rome should recognise the government at Fiume, so that the representatives of the Regency should be invited to Rapallo, and so that the government at Rome should avoid any armed attack on Fiume. At the outset, I called the attack of Christmas Eve an enormous crime, and I always upheld the spirit of justice, liberty, and free will, which were the inspiration of the legions of Ronchi. The Audience in the Gallery It sometimes happens in history, as in the theatre, that there is an audience in the gallery which, having paid for its tickets, demands that the performance shall run to a close at all costs. Thus, in Italy today, there are two types of individuals, those who blame D'Annunzio for having lived to see the end of the Fiume tragedy, and those who blame Mussolini for not having brought about that easy, pretty little thing which is called a revolution. I have always disdained the cowardly method by which, in Italy, impotence, anger and misery are laid upon the heads of real or imaginary scapegoats. The Fasci have never promised to bring about revolution in the event of an attack on Fiume, nor have I ever written or made known to D'Annunzio that revolution depended upon my caprice. Revolution is not a jack-in-the-box which could be worked at will. I do not carry it in my pocket any more than those who fill their noisy mouths with its name, and in practice do not get beyond disorders in the squares after unimportant demonstrations accompanied by a providential arrest to avoid any more serious complications. I know the breed. I have been in politics for twenty years. In the war between Caviglia and Fiume, either great things should have been accomplished, or else, for reasons of self-respect, excessive shouting and raising of smoke, which vanished at once without trace and without bloodshed, 
should have been avoided. With whom and where? History learned from far-off events teaches men little, but that which we see written daily under our eyes ought to be more successful. Now these chronicles of every day tell us that revolution is made with an army and not against an army, with arms, not without arms, with movements of trained squadrons, not with the untrained masses called to meetings in the squares. They succeed when they are made in an atmosphere of sympathy on the part of the majority. If this is lacking, they die down and fail. Now in Fiume, the army and navy did not fail. A certain revolutionary spirit of the eleventh hour did not take definite shape. It was the work sometimes of anarchists and sometimes of nationalists. According to some emissaries, it was possible to put the devil and holy water together, the nation and that which was against the nation. Messiano and Delcroix. Now, I reject all forms of Bolshevism. But if I were obliged to choose one, I should choose that of Moscow and Lenin, if for no other reason, because at least it has gigantic, barbaric and universal proportions. What revolution was it to be then? National or Bolshevist? A great uncertainty, complicated by a great many minor considerations, confused men's minds, while the nation, in a mood of revolt against that which had happened around Fiume, abandoned itself to an attitude of grief, in which the only bright spot was the hope that the episode would retain its local character and come quickly to a peaceful conclusion. Hypotheses and Certainties If there had been an insurrection on our part, and this was not possible owing to the armed forces which the government had at its disposal, there must have been one of two results, defeat or victory. In the first case, everything would have been irretrievably lost in the abyss of civil war. Let us, for the sake of argument, presuppose the second hypothesis, that of victory with the fall of the government and of the regime. After the more or less easy period of demolition, what form would the revolution take? Social, as some Bolshevists to wish, those with the motto, always further left, the equivalent of the grotesque go to the reddest, or national, Dalmatian and reactionary, as others desire. There was no possibility of reconciliation between the two currents. In a revolution of the social order, what importance would the territorial questions, and more precisely that of Dalmatia, have had? In the other event of a national revolution against the Treaty of Apollo, everything would have been limited to a formal annulment of the treaty and to a substitution of men, to be followed later by another treaty in another Apollo, in order that one day or another the nation might have her peace. An episode of civil war was not remedied by letting loose a bigger war in times like these through which we are passing, and nobody is capable of prolonging and creating artificially historical situations which are over and done with. Only the man who knows how to lift himself above common passions, who knows how to draw conclusions from conflicting elements and how to distinguish the pure grain from the equivocal chaff, is able to understand that Fumo Christmas, which can be called the tragic crossroads between the reasons of the state and of the ideal, the meeting place of all our deficiencies and all our greatness. Suspended Problems The first is that of Fumo. We do not feel the necessity of reaffirming our sympathy for the sacrificed city. We have given the most tangible proofs, recently, of our solidarity with the fascia of Fiume in order to put it in a position to undertake the struggle against the Croats, who are now beginning to show signs of life. The action of the fascisti must tend, for the moment, towards economic annexation of Fiume to Italy, to arousing interest of the government and private individuals and at the same time keeping alive by every means the torch of Italy, so that in due time economic will be followed by political annexation. We shall achieve this in spite of everything. All the fascista force, national and parliamentary, must be concentrated on Zara, so that the little city shall be able to accomplish her important and delicate mission in history. There must be efficacious education for the Italians who have remained in the principal cities of Dalmatia, and no separate constituencies for the Slavs in Istria and the Germans in the Upper Adage. 
It is not possible to establish such a precedent, as it would carry us far. The French of the Val d'Oste, who are in reality excellent Italians, have no special constituencies and privileges of that sort. These duplicate constituencies would be a grave mistake. It is up to the fascisti of Trento and Trieste to prevent this happening at any cost. Old and New Directions The lines of the programme laid down at the meeting at Milan in May last year have not become out of date or in need of revision. Fascismo has the name of being imperialist. This accusation goes together with that of being reactionary. Fascismo is against renunciations when they mean humiliation and diminution. Given these general premises, first, the fascismo does not believe in the principles of the so-called League of Nations, nor in its vitality. Secondly, the fascismo does not believe in the Red Internationals, which die, reproduce themselves, multiply and die again. They are small artificial organizations, small minorities compared to the masses of the population, which, living, dying, progressing, or retrogressing, finishes by deciding those changes of interests before which the international organizations of the first, second, and third order crumble to pieces. Thirdly, that fascismo does not believe in the immediate possibility of general disarmament. And fourthly, considers that Italy, in the present historical period, should follow a policy of European equilibrium and conciliation, it follows that the Italian fascia of fighters demands 1. That the treaties of peace shall be revised and modified in those parts which are proved inapplicable, or which might prove in application the cause of formidable hatred and new wars. 2. The economic annexation of Fiume to Italy, or the care of the Italians resident in Dalmatia. 3. The gradual economic emancipation of Italy from abroad by the development of her productive forces. 4. The renewal of relations with the enemy countries, Austria, Germany, Bulgaria, Turkey and Hungary, but with dignity and holding fast to the supreme necessity of maintaining our northern and eastern boundaries. 5. The creation and intensification of friendly relations with the peoples of the East, not excluding those governed by the Soviet and Southeastern Europe. 6. The vindication of the rights and interests of the nation as regards the colonies. 7. The abandonment of the old systems and the replacement of all our diplomatic representatives with others from the special university faculties. 8. The furtherance of the Italian colonies in the Mediterranean and beyond the Atlantic, by economic and educational means, and by rapid communications. Towards a new Italy, I have enormous faith in the future greatness of the Italian people. Ours is the most numerous and homogeneous of the peoples of Europe. The war has enormously increased the prestige of Italy. Long live Italy! is now cried in far off Latonia and still more distant Georgia. Italy is the tricolor wing of Ferroin, the magnetic wave of Marconi, the baton of Toscanini, the revival of Dante in the sixth century of its departure. Let us prepare ourselves by energetic everyday work for the Italy of tomorrow of which we dream, an Italy free and rich, resounding with song, with her skies and seas populated with her fleets, and her earth fruitful beneath her ploughs. And may the coming citizens be able to say what Virgil said of ancient Rome. Imperium Oceano, Farmum Timamavit Astras. The empire ended with the ocean, but her fame reached the stars. End of section 20.